We're now recording. Okay, great. are still pouring in, so I'm just going to give it one more minute. Just make sure all board members are here as soon as, here we go. All right, Donna, do you have the administrators you're looking for? I didn't see Troy come in. Troy, are you here? I saw him. Okay. But I could be wrong. Troy, speak up if you're here. I thought I saw you. Oh, I'm here. Okay. There he is. And that's when. All right. Does that sound good to you, Donna? Yes, I think we should get started. Okay, I do too. There's a lot to do tonight. So um, first off, I want to say welcome to the Cape Elizabeth School Board, this special business meeting, Tuesday, August 1st, 2020, via Zoom. Um, these are difficult and unique, different times for sure. We're reinventing the wheel in everything that we do. Um, and these meetings are uh, similar. There have been some questions as to why we are even contemplating going into classrooms and still doing board meetings um, via Zoom. Uh, and one of the reasons that uh, we're continuing this is we want to maximize the participation. And with social distancing, there would be a, a great limit to the amount of people that could come into town hall. So this just allows for that much more access for people to be um, present for this. So thank you for understanding that. Um, I also am gonna try to run this. Last meeting was a business meeting and um, mm -hmm. it turned out to become more of like a workshop um, or a forum, which I think was very necessary. It turned out to become a lot of question answering and a lot of comments from teachers and um, members of the community. And I am glad that it turned out that way. I think that was very important. Uh, tonight, we have a lot of um, information to cover. There's a lot of presentations, um, administrators, and then the board has to do the due diligence, the work of uh, discussing um, before votes. So that being said, I just want to explain that we're going to try to treat this very similar to a business meeting that would happen inside town hall. Um, there is a chat feature here that we tried to turn off. Um, but we were unsuccessful. So if you can avoid the chat feature, um, we would very much appreciate that. Um, and we're not going to be looking at it at all. Same is true with Facebook Live. We can't access any kind of communication there. There will be comment on the agenda. The second item on the agenda is comments. Um, and I'll speak to that when we get to that point a little bit. Um, but before we do get started, I just want to welcome everybody, say thank you so much for your interest for being here. Um, these are not easy times. These are very difficult decisions. There, um, there's no ideal choice um, by any means. I have been reading so many emails and I am so touched by the heartfelt um, sentiments, concerns, um, comments, um, recommendations, suggestions, and questions that have come through. Uh, we will hopefully try to answer as many of those tonight as possible through the presentations. Chances are we will not answer every question, but um, the administrators have all seen them. Um, a list of the questions has been compiled and shared with them um, with the hope that uh, they will try to answer as many of those as possible. Um, I want to thank you for your grace of um, the understanding. There was so many emails that were sent that were respectful, appreciative of the work we're doing, um, and um, patient. So thank you for all of that. Uh, and I want to say again, thank you for 
the work that the leaders in our district, the superintendent, the administrators, the nurses, uh, Perry as the facilities director, um, and all the thinking, and I don't even know all the details, but I know there's been a lot of teachers involved um, putting their minds and doing trainings on their own. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. We are going to try to keep this meeting to um, two hours if possible. We'll have to reevaluate, but out of respect for people's time, that is the goal. So that being said, um, can we stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Donna, we're gonna use your, thank you. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty and justice for all. Okay, to start with, are there any adjustments to the agenda? And I did not, so Hope, I see Hope raising her hand, go ahead. Um, I just wanted to um, ask a question and potentially p propose a change. So l the last time we met, we approved the calendar first, and then we heard a presentation. And I think some of us thought, hey, that, that seemed like it was, it should have been in a different order because the calendar may presupposes a, a, a result of the discussion. So maybe we want to swap them. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you for that, Hope. We actually, uh, spoke with Donna Kimberly as the vice chair and myself. We spoke to Donna and she had it that way with it second and we thought it was a little more streamlined this time um, and that we could get that over with. But I am fine to um, have it be afterwards. I think the conversation about the agenda will maybe answer some of the questions that people have and sort of answer some of what we're looking for in making the vote about how to start school. And I think my reason for wanting it first was that the, um, the, the piece that tripped us up last, last time was that we didn't realize that many districts were changing the flex day from Friday and Wednesday. And so okay. my understanding is that this presentation of the calendar is pretty straight and forward and there's no sort of surprise from other communities that might trip us up later. But I am totally fine to change it to afterwards if that's the will of the board. Why don't I just, um, not as a vote, but because I can't see everybody and see you're nodding, I'm just gonna call your name, board members, and if you'd like it changed to after, you can say change. If you'd like it where it is, you can just say where it is. Does that sound good, Hope? Yep. Okay. So I'm gonna to vote to keep it where it is, but I don't really care. Kimberly, do you have an opinion? Um, I'll vote to keep it where it is. Uh, Phil. Um, I'll vote to move it. That made a lot of sense to me. Okay, that's fine. Elizabeth. No opinion. Okay, Nasser. I will follow Elizabeth. No opinion. Okay, Hope. I, I think we should move it. If, it. if it presupposes red, yellow, or green, it, it, we're putting the cart before the horse. Okay, so you're saying move it. Yeah, is what I hear. Great, and then Laura. I vote on moving it, please. Okay, so we will move the vote for the calendar to after the end of the meeting. Um, uh, any other, thank you for that, Hope. Any other adjustments to the agenda? Okay, moving on, um, we have comments from the public. Um, and this is my last little spiel and uh, speech. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're gonna try to keep this similar to a regular business meeting. And I just wanna review what that means. Um, again, last time it morphed into something a little different, but necessary at the time. Uh, our comment based on policy, comments from the public time is a 20 minute slot. And 
members of the community are allowed to speak for a three minute time frame. Um, we will be timing you just to sort of keep tabs on it a little bit. Um, if you can refrain from repetition, um, one thing I would like to say is that I have spoken to board members. I know every board member has read um, with open hearts every one of the emails that have come in. So, um, you know, trying to not be too repetitive in your comments or concerns uh, would benefit with the timing. Um, again, I just want to reiterate that we're not using chat. The way this will work is that you will raise your hand. Can somebody, Elizabeth, I'm thinking you might know this, or maybe Laura, because you're familiar with Zoom. Can somebody uh, remind people how to raise their hand electronically? Yep, you can just go to reactions, which is at the bottom of your screen, tap on reactions. Oh, and then, but I don't see it there. Let me yeah. see, participants. If you click on oh, participants. You go to participants and then you go to raise hand. Yes. Okay, great. So participants and raise hand. Great. Okay, so if you would like to speak, thank you for that, Laura and Elizabeth. If you would like to speak, you go under participants, uh, click raise hand. I'll be looking for those uh, blue hands to call on people. So that being said, um, are there any comments? I see Josh Dennison. Do you want to unmute yourself? Good evening. Josh Dennison, 17 Bay Bay Lane, Cape Elizabeth, Maine. Uh, I just want to first start by saying thank you for holding this meeting tonight. Uh, I know that I was on the last meeting and it got a little crazy um, and I won't beat a dead horse, but I do want to say that, you know, I work here in town for uh, Public Works going on 13 years. Uh, I've been a citizen of Cape Elizabeth uh, on and off my whole life. And now as an adult and parent uh, with two children in the school system, I uh, was able to be back here and raise my kids. Very proud of that. Um, my kids attended summer camp this summer. Um, I think that the town manager sent out a beautiful email thanking all the people who made that happen. Um, my kids uh, were very safe and uh, had no issues uh, whatsoever. It actually told us that it was the best summer camp that they had ever had. Um, and uh, I really appreciate all the hard work that went into that via Kathy, Kathy Raftus and Kelly Finney. Um, and on the fact of going back to school, um, it's very important for me uh, personally and my family and my wife and I um, that our child uh, is in the classroom. Um, he uh, does very well with in-classroom learning. Remote learning is very tricky for him. Um, you know, I feel that given the pandemic, we're in new times uh, and new times call for new uh, protocols and things that we've all had to get adjusted to. Uh, I was home last fall with my kids doing the home educational piece. It was very difficult. Uh, I provide for this town, uh, as you know, public works, I plow roads and keep things open. And, you know, I was not able to be at my job and I'm very thankful that the town let me be home. I will ever be thankful for that. Um, but it is very important to me and my family for our children to be in the classroom uh, learning. I think it can be done safely for those who choose to do it. Um, the numbers uh, are there, uh, especially if you watch today. Um, I think that, you know, I see both sides of it. I'm, I'm not a closed-minded person. I understand with teachers and families. Um, I personally liked the Friday being the floating day because it made it towards the end of the week and it was a little bit easier, but I do understand coinciding and helping with teachers with their schedules with the other kids. Uh, I do look at teachers as essential workers. Uh, my wife works in the hospital uh, running a floor at me medical center. Um, she sees patients day in, day out, uh, and we've been living through this just fine uh, and going about our lives um, and being the best practice we can. Um, you know, it is not easy uh, to be a working parent where both of us leave the house at 6.30 in the morning and have to worry about knowing if our kids are going to be able to go to school or not um, financially and as far as mentally, um, especially on the mentally aspect. Uh, you know, it, mental health of the children and the, the interaction at school is very important, uh, especially for younger kids and older kids. Uh, some say, oh, well, just the younger kids need to go. I think it's just as important for the older kids in high school. Uh, it all stems down to just doing our best, uh, our best practices and supporting our children to get the best education they can. And I can only speak for myself and my family, but I know 
that our children really need to be in the school system where they learn best. Uh, thank you very much for all your time and hard work. And I'm proud to be a part of this community and an employee of the town. Thank you. Thank you so much, Josh. And thank you for all you do for our town. Are there any else? I'm not seeing any, so I'm just going to give another moment. I know that sometimes, there we go. Audra Gore, I would like to invite you to speak. You have three minutes if you want to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, I would love, if it could be possible, to maybe have a district-wide um, opportunity, for example, on Thursdays, all the assignments, all the schedules, all the plans for the next week to be announced. And that way it allows families with so many different dynamic schedules and things happening. If parents are available on weekends to help their children, it then gives a chance um, for those families to help their kids before things are late, but to actually participate within the school schedules and the assignments and whatnot. But if it was district wide with families balancing multiple schools of elementary, middle school, high school schedules, just throwing that out there. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, Betsy Nielsen is up. You can unmute yourself. Betsy? Thank you. Um, I know that you said that you received lots of emails today from people, and I'm sure you've been inundated with those, but there's really no way to know whether or not one that we sent did get through. So um, I'm not sure if you would prefer not to have people um, go ahead and, and read those things or not, but in just in case that it didn't get through, I did want to share what I had sent to the board, if that's okay. I can share that it did get through. Yeah. All right. So is your, were your comments in the beginning to um, urge people to not repeat those or? I think my comments in the beginning, Betsy, were to say, um, I did not respond. I had family visiting and was not responding to emails. I did read them. I did not sit down if an email came in today. I did not respond to them, um, but I have responded to probably 75 to 100 emails in the past two weeks. Um, so I have past 10 days. So um, my apologies for not getting that to you. Um, and my point being earlier is that um, I think your message was read and heard and, and understood by the board members. Um, so but I, I see Phil nodding his head yes. Um, I, I see Donna saying that she's seen it and hope and um, I, I know that and Laura, I know that our board is very, so if the intention was to read it in order to be sure that the board saw it, I. I I can guarantee, uh, based on what I'm seeing and what I know, that, that it was read and heard and taken to heart. I didn't mean that as any type of a slight for not having a response. I understand I, that. And I didn't think you did. I did not think you did. So, right. thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for sharing your thoughts. They're important to hear everybody's opinions and voices in this. Um, are there any other comments? Okay, Zakia Nelson, you have the time. To can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great, thank you. So I wondered if you could um, share uh, with me and the group um, if there is a procedure for um, investigating some, you know, suspected cases in, among students or teachers or staff. So for example, if, you know, uh, Bobby 
um, goes home with a, a sore throat and a, you know, fever or whatever, what happens after that with regards to the teachers that um, that student may have come into contact with or other students, the classroom, um, you know, would there be quarantining or testing and how is that going to be communicated to the families um, that that student may have come into contact with? Um, and I also have a quick follow-up question. I don't know whether you want me to say it now or wait until you've answered that one. Thank you, Zakia. This, um, you may have come in a little bit late. This comment period is not a question answer period. We are not gonna respond right now to- okay, I'm so sorry. No, that's okay. Um, uh, perhaps the nurses will touch on that in their presentation, but um, thank you for that question. If you'd like to follow through, you have another minute and a half if you'd like to just throw a question out there. Um, again, we won't respond, but we're listening. Okay, um, sure. Uh, another question that I will throw out there, not expecting a response, yeah. but um, perhaps the uh, nurses or I can get an answer another time is um, whether the, um, the school department has a um, has considered a threshold number of cases um, if there were to be cases um, in the, you know, with students that were return in the hybrid model um, before uh, they would consider going 100% remote. So uh, in the hybrid model, if there are cases or infections that um, are uh, reported and confirmed, um, you know, at what point uh, might there uh, be a switch to the 100% uh, remote um, model if, uh, you know, if necessary. So thank you. And uh, I'm sorry, I did come in a couple minutes late. So I, my, my apologies to everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Zakia. We're all learning. Um, I see that John Volt has his hand raised. John, if you want to unmute yourself, you have three minutes. Welcome. Are you there, John? Uh, it looks like he took his hand down. So I'm not sure he actually wanted to speak. Are there any other comments? Again, I just want to give it a little bit of time. Another. I see John, or Cree Swift, if you would like to unmute, you have three minutes. Hi, Heather, thank you. Hi, Cree. This is Cree Swift, I'm at 88 Oakhurst Road, um, and a parent to a high schooler and a middle schooler. And I just wanted to raise for the school board, um, the students in the special education program. And I think following up a little bit on Audra's comment, um, suggestion about um, uh, sort of setting up uh, clear schedules for students on Thursdays. Um, I don't necessarily support Thursdays, um, but I do think particularly for children in special education curriculum, if we go to a hybrid or a remote learning situation of any sort, um, the importance of clear communication with families and consistent, um, consistent forum, whether it's Zoom or Google Meets or Flipgrid or whatever it is, if you're dealing with a student, and this is probably true for some of the younger elementary students as well, but if you're dealing with um, a student who is unable to read, for example, who's getting dozens of emails every day telling him what's going on in his classes. Um, and you're dealing with kids without executive functioning skills who are trying to keep straight what classes they have on Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays, whatever. Um, that was a very challenging uh, remote learning experience. And I hope that uh, if, if we do end up in a remote or hybrid learning um, model, I hope that, uh, that the school board is paying a lot of attention to what's happening in the special education programs um, in particular, because I think those are very challenging. Thank you. 
Thank you, Cree. Uh, John, if you would like to try again, you can unmute yourself and you have three minutes. John Volz. John. Test. Is this John? Yes. Okay. Test. You have three minutes, John. Sorry. Thank you. No worries. So, um, I just wanted to pull back a little bit. I, I know that uh, this semester, upcoming semester, is going to be probably like any other we've ever had. Um, the last year's was so we started normal and sort of things went to uh, sort of make do, go remote, do the best you can. Um, but now we're sort of going into this planning a little bit, knowing what's, what's coming, and things are changing really rapidly. And I got to say, um, I, I, I have a concern that things are going to be um, I don't see what the rush is to get everyone back in the building. I understand what the testing levels are here in Maine and here in the Northeast, um, but those things change relatively fast. And we've seen schools across the nation open and close again right away with many cases. We're heading into the winter where we're gonna have people more indoors than ever before after all the schools open. And I just worry that this semester is different than any other semester. Every week we wait, every month we wait, every quarter we wait. We're that much closer to more effective treatment, possible vaccines, and more effective national mitigation. And if you've seen what the disease experts have been saying about what's going to be happening likely in our country, if we don't have effective national mitigation, is a significant rise in cases. And those are likely to come here to us. Two weeks ago, we had schools open, even though we're seeing cases drop now, those numbers show up in two weeks. And then two weeks after that, they'll show up where those people have traveled. And lots of people in Cumberland County travel. Less than before, but they travel a lot. That's why I think we had cases here early. So I would just, urge folks to think about delaying in person for those that can do it as much as possible and to think about prioritizing in-person learning as safe as possible for those that need it the most. Younger kids and kids who have special needs, I think would be a priority for using your in-person space as safely as possible. And those that can go remote or do something that is not in person, it will be a, likely be a very different world, um, and a, something we can all better plan for and much more like what we're used to uh, when the next semester begins. So I appreciate everyone's um, uh, work and effort. It's not an easy situation, but I have to ask again, really what is the rush to get people back in the building? Um, right now I feel like you know, we've gotten a little bit complacent um, it's like playing on the highway at midnight when there's no cars. You're still playing on the highway. You're going to get results right now because our testing numbers right now are low that are not indicative of the risk you may actually be undertaking. Thank you, John. Thank you. Um, I see Eliza Rauscher. Hi, yes, it's Chris and Eliza Rauscher at 53 Beach Bluff. Thanks for all your hard work on this. I know these are uh, uh, very different and difficult times and thanks for your communication. We are interested in hearing a discussion about outdoor classrooms, especially for younger students and for families who may choose to do the remote option but would be interested in a hybrid model wherein the, our students could go to school one or two days a week for outdoor classrooms. Thank you. Thank you. And then this is our last speaker. Uh, this is our time limit. I have eight A. Reiniger. Hi. Yes, it's Alice Reiniger. Hi. Alice. Hi. I'll, you know what? I hate to be on this screen, but I'll do it. <laughs> Forgive me. Um, <clears throat> just I wanted to comment. Um, 
have become, like many of us, so focused on reading as much as we can to learn what's going on with COVID-19 <clears throat> and um, even listening to our CDC director's um, press sessions that he has now twice a week. And, you know, we had one case yesterday statewide um, <clears throat> and he said that it's absolutely possible we could be like Florida or Arizona. And it just set me aback that he said that because since July 1, which is now more than six weeks, we've been open to many other states. And even before that, we knew a lot of people came in and there's not been a single outbreak related to all the tourism. Um, if you go to Old Orchard Beach, very few people wore masks and there's been no outbreak. I believe that we've opened up a lot and to have not seen and not only a big spike, but no spike, in fact, a decline, I think we can actually be optimistic and hopeful that if we stick to the basic CDC guidelines that, and I, I know I did put this in my email to you, but I'm so emphatic that delaying, I think, hurts our children and our families more than going back, being hopeful that covering our droplets, covering our mouths with masks, washing our hands, keeping a distance when we can, will allow us to be as safe as possible. So I wanted to share that and thank you so much. And thank you for that and hijacked as well for all your work. Yeah. Thank you so much. So this concludes the comment portion of the meeting. We'll move on to item three, which are administrative reports. And we'll start with our superintendent Wolfram. I'm coming. Uh, so I would like to thank the many staff and parents and citizens who have weighed in on the start of school this fall. As, um, as Heather commented, we have spent a lot of time reading the emails and the administrative team has had many long discussions um, with the first concern of safety and the second concern of providing an excellent education for our students. Um, always with the concern of what is best for our students. We've listened to parents who have pleaded with us to open our schools for the social and emotional well being of their students, and also to parents and staff who want to keep our school buildings closed. We have thoroughly reviewed the main CDC guidelines and have continued to work on our ever evolving plans. Our calendar change proposal reflects many of the requested changes, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Whatever is decided tonight surely will not please everybody. However, again, we've identified safety of students and staff and providing an excellent education to our students as our two top priorities. And that's the administrative team I'm talking about. I did re receive word today that the uh, Maine CDC has updated their guidance and this will be posted tomorrow morning at seven o'clock, they said, for those of you um, who will tune into that. So in order to meet the needs of staff, and uh, again, we listened to what everybody said and read all the emails, and um, we propo are proposing to move the, um, the non-maroon or gold day, which was Friday to uh, Wednesday, to be more consistent with our neighboring districts. Staff will work from home that day, using the morning to support their students who need extra support, and the afternoon for planning with their colleagues um, in grade level content areas or department teams or on the designated PD days participating virtually in those PD opportunities. So we have, uh, we're proposing to move the, Wednesday, the Friday to Wednesday. We've also reviewed the requests for adding planning, training and preparation time at the start of the year. And we propose that August 24th through September 3rd be used as PD um, and training days for staff, as well as preparing rooms for safety uh, should we go into the hybrid model. This will require removing unnecessary furniture. This preparation um, would require removing unnecessary, unnecessary furniture and material from classrooms in order to facilitate cleaning, disinfecting, and sanitizing. Uh, teachers would be required to be in their classroom for these two weeks for the virtual trainings um, and they may bring their children with the understanding that they need to stay in the teachers classrooms. Training all the trainings for teachers would will be virtual and will focus on protocols and procedures within a school day, health and safety practices, preparing rooms, 
and technology changes such as the use of Zoom through the district. The improved use of technology for remote and in-class learning and the many state mandated trainings that schools are required to provide for teachers uh, each year. Staff will spend time during these two weeks preparing the rooms in order to provide social distancing and removing all personal furniture, rugs, toys, et cetera. And right now, Perry's looking into storage places such as warehouses, trailers, or places in the community to store any extra furniture or items that, um, that are removed from the classroom. So that would be the first two weeks of school, staff only um, in school. Um, with um, their children allowed in their classrooms with them. September 8th through 18th will be used to roll in various groups of students. We're calling it the student roll-in weeks as we be begin the hybrid model, if we begin the hybrid model. Um, it would help us with our training of uh, students in the room in very small groups and test our safety procedures again in small groups such as moving in the hallways, bathroom procedures, lunch procedures, et cetera. The first day of roll-in, which would be September 8th, would be used differently according to the needs of each school. For example, possibly at the high school, bringing in um, freshmen. Um, we've talked about many different um, possibilities for that. Wednesdays, September 9th and 16th, would be used to distribute devices to students participating in the 100% remote learning program, as well as giving those remote students the opportunity to meet their teachers either in person in the morning or virtually during the afternoon. Remote assignments for staff will be made on the basis of documented high risk circumstances and the need based on the number of students requesting the 100% remote learning experience. Um, we are putting out um, forms um, and, and brief descriptions of the 100% uh, remote learning experience and people will need to complete those forms um, so that the principals need the numbers of students um, in order that, that we can do planning. Um, so we can plan for those students. It, re it may mean um, moving some students that we thought were gonna be in class if we do the, or in school during the hybrid to a remote situation. So it will impact the, the um, the way we use our staff. Um, other days during the two student roll-in weeks, we'll work with the maroon and gold structure um, in order to get people used to that based on the specific groups of students that have been identified to attend that day. And principals will be um, communicating who those students are. Uh, students for the two roll-in weeks will be distributed, schedules for the two roll-in weeks will be distributed by the principals of each school. During these days, students will receive health and safety trainings and technology trainings. There'll be a focus on so the social emotional needs of our students, as well as executive functioning, building relationships, and training for students and safety protocols and building procedures. So these will be done in very small groups. These two weeks will allow us to test our buildings for safety procedures and technology capacities with smaller groups of students. During the 100% remote learning program, students will be meeting their teachers and receive trainings in scheduling, instructional expectations, and new technology that will be necessary for instruction um, during these two student roll-in weeks. On September 21st, we're proposing that the maroon and gold regular content area instruction will start for all students according to the maroon and gold schedule. This every other day planned for the in-school hybrid model stu in students build on the educational model of direct instruction and gradual release by the teacher on the day of in-school instruction, followed by time to individually practice and develop questions on the remote day with the teachers correcting misconceptions without several days of incorrect practicing. Students have been carefully divided into learning groups in order to social distance at three feet and six feet for eating. Family considerations have been made as well as creating a balance, uh, especially at the elementary and middle levels um, of gender, abilities, needs, and all of the other considerations that staff look at in order to create balanced classes. Implementation of the hybrid model would hinge on at least two important factors. The first one is the availability of PPE, 
And the second one is the available of, availability of substitutes to supervise students. Uh, we have ordered a supply of PPE through the state, <clears throat> and this supply, supply should last at least into November. Um, included in this order is uh, 1,986 boxes of 50 each, three ply disposable masks, 7,944 cloth mask coverings, 460 face shields, 265 gallons of hand sanitizer, and um, 1,890 um, KN95 non-medical disposable masks. All students and staff will be required to wear masks at all times during the school day. Students and staff may provide their own masks as long as they are in accordance with accepted CDC standards. We will have extra masks on hand to supply to those who need, need or want them. Uh, students will be required to wear masks to school as specified in the document from the Maine Department of Education framework for reopening schools, and I quote, adults, including educators and staff, are required to wear a mask or face covering. Students age two and above are required to wear a mask slash face covering that covers their, their nose and mouth. Masks, face coverings must be worn by all students on the bus. Oh. So this would be explained to parents in the parent contract that they would be asked to sign. Uh, mask breaks for students will be provided periodically with six feet of social distancing required during those times. Students who feel that they cannot comply with the mask requirement should enroll in the remote learning program, should a hybrid model be adopted tonight. We have surveyed substitutes on our list and approximately half of those substitutes have agreed to substitute again this year. We raised the substitute pay. However, we will be needing more substitutes in our buildings to supervise our students. Um, I would urge any parents or community members who wish to substitute to contact our business office to apply. Um, that would be extremely helpful because we can't have school if we don't have coverage for our students. Should we not receive PPE before the proposed start of school? Should we run out of PPE or should we not have enough coverage? for our in-school students, we will need to move to a remote learning situation. Signage has been ordered and is starting, Perry will probably talk about that later, but it's starting to filter in. So moving the start date for students back one week should allow time for the now predicted delivery date of August 31st to be met and the installation of signage to occur. Ventilation is an area of extreme concern as we look at our aging buildings. Perry will speak more about the ventilation issue tonight. He's walked each building and identified areas of venti ventilation concern, and we will move, work to move staff and students in these areas to alternate settings in order to provide them a safe environment. This will be, mean being creative in our use of space within our buildings, such as possibly using larger areas, such as cafeterias, gymnasium, gymnasiums, or alternate classrooms. There have been many questions about schedules and descriptions of programs for both the hybrid model and the 100% remote learning model. School administrators and teams of teachers have been working for most of the summer on these plans and principals will um, describe somewhat their plans tonight. Unless teachers have a doctor's note recommending that they teach remotely, they will be expected to be teaching from their classrooms, whether we start school in the 100% remote model or the hybrid model, where they will have access to all their teaching materials and will be able to give their undivided attention to their students on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. Again, Wednesday would be an at-home student support and uh, virtual planning meeting um, and PD on PD. Wednesdays. This plan would address our first two priorities, safety, because staff would be working by themselves in the rooms and providing a quality education experience for our students. Wednesdays, again, will be a work from home day for staff, um, again, offering student support in the morning and planning uh, with colleagues um, and uh, participating in PD sessions in the afternoons. The administrative team has thoroughly studied scheduling options for the hybrid model, such as eliminating uh, half-day sessions due to the lack of disinfecting time between sessions. I know that that was 
discussed um, and actually sounds like a great idea. Have half the kids in the morning, have the kids in the afternoon, but there is not time to disinfect between sessions. Uh, we have identified the model that as educators and administrators, we feel will be the safest for our students and offer the best education in these circumstances. Principals have been working on student assignments, but we need, we've now discovered that we need the information regarding the 100% remote uh, enrollment in order to finalize those lists. So we will be, again, sending out enrollment forms, I believe tomorrow with descriptions of the programs, and then the assignments will be distributed to parents um, and sent to um, Pat Fowler in the transportation part, uh, department so that she can work on the busing schedules. We are required to provide three feet social distancing spaces on the buses. So only students assigned to specific buses will be allowed to ride those buses. Busing schedules will be released when they are incomplete closer to the opening of school if we open in the hybrid model. Questions about, have been asked about our efforts to improve the remote learning experience for our students. Director of Teaching and Learning, Kathy Stankard, will provide information about our efforts towards this improvement tonight and principals will describe the efforts to improve remote learning within their staff. Several community members, we heard one tonight, have asked about the possibility of outside learning environments for our students. So when we make the decision um, about the model of instruction that we will open within the fall, we will be exploring spaces that are available for this learning around our campus and scheduling those opportunities. Uh, Noel will be talking later tonight about issues with the connectivity outside of our school buildings and that will impact the use of technology outside. Tonight, Jeff Thorak will be offering the latest information about athletics, another area of concern. This is an area that has been in flux all summer with guidance from the Maine Principals Association constantly changing, requiring each, each athletic director to alter plans. This guidance will likely continue to change throughout the rest of the summer as, and fall as conditions change. After a decision is made regarding the model in which we will start school, uh, we will develop de more details and distribute information to parents through our website, Tower School, and our Facebook page. There are many procedures that have been developed throughout the summer as administrators and teachers have worked and reworked our strategies for what instruction will look like in various models. There are still many, many, many details to work out and we will convey the information as soon as possible. Undoubtedly, as we start the year, we will encounter procedures and schedules that do not work and unexpected, unanticipated challenges. We will be constantly reassessing our plans and revising if needed. We ask for your patience in these trying and challenging times. We are in uncharted and stressful times, and we were working long hours in order to plan for our students' education. As we progress through the next few weeks, staff and parents should refer specific procedural questions to their building administrators. District questions can be referred to me at central office. We ask for your patience as we work to distribute information and we respect, we respect your frustration as you try to plan for the fall. Thank you. Uh, thank you for that very detailed description, Donna, um, and into these conversations. I just want to remind everybody of two sort of details. If you can be sure to mute yourself so that we can hear more clearly the presenters. And um, just a reminder, if anybody showed up late, that we are not using chat section of um, feature of uh, Zoom. So uh, I do see Elizabeth's hand up. Um, it might be helpful to just to wait until everybody presents. I don't know if you have a specific question for me, Elizabeth, or um, there's- I do, and it's not about schedules or buildings okay. or anything. Sure. I think it's just, it's something that I know and it's something that you know, but it's something that I think many of the members of the public really don't understand. And I'm hearing a lot of dishwashing right now and talking, yeah, so. I think, um, again, if, if thank you. Um, so I think Donna, it would be really helpful for everybody to understand what does green actually mean to Cape Elizabeth? 
why don't we why can't we just throw the doors open and have everybody come in people people honestly don't understand you know why we're having these conversations that we're having so it'd be really helpful to understand that we have the the choice to go 100 percent remote and we have the choice to go hybrid but we really don't have the choice to go 100% in person and you can talk about sure. that. So there's really, um, there's really two levels of green. One would be kind of, um, I guess, a miracle or a, a vaccine where we would go, uh, we would just all be able to go back to school like it was before and there would be no danger of COVID. Perhaps um, because of uh, vaccinations um, or it disappeared miraculously or something. So we, we don't think that's going to happen. The other green um, is a green, but you, is everybody would come back to school, but you have to follow the CDC and the main Department of Education guidelines. We cannot do that because we cannot uh, use six, we cannot offer six feet uh, or three feet social di distancing for all of our students to have a, a class of 20 plus a teacher. We don't have the spaces in our classroom um, to have all of the students come back with three feet of social distancing, nor do we have the space um, likewise for the six feet of distancing that is needed for eating. So it's really the piece of about social distancing that um, is keeping us from, go from sending all of our students back. Does that help to answer that? I think so. I just, I, I, there's been a lot of that circulating around the community. People don't understand that if everybody in the state is green, why I hear people saying, why, you know, why, why are people even considering hybrid? We're green and they don't understand that we have to follow. There, the there are very few districts that can go back uh, with 100% of their students and, and ensure the social distancing. Some of the newer schools that are built with bigger spaces are able to do that. There are very few. Uh, some of the schools who have um, very low enrollment, their enrollment uh, enrollments have dropped, um, you know, in the in the far north of Maine. But um, in in our districts um, and in Cape Elizabeth, we just don't have the space to ensure uh, social distancing um, according to the CDC guidelines. Thank you, Donna. For everyone, Donna and. Following up on that, am I correct to say that even if we got creative and used library spaces or gym spaces or outdoor spaces, when you do that, you split a classroom into two to allow for the social distancing and then we wouldn't have the staff to cover all the students, is that correct? That is correct. We'd have to double our staff. Um, and we're still under the um, certification guidelines or laws really so that um, you know, teachers have to be um, certified teachers, so. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, again, just a reminder to mute so that we can hear. We have the principals. Uh, how about we start with Jason, our Jason Mandarini is our Pond Cove principal. Thank you, Heather. Um, would I be able to share my screen? Are sure. you able to make me a co-host or? Jen will do her magic and make you a co-host. Okay. Yeah, okay. you are on. Oh, I, okay. Let's see. So, um, Heather or Donna, it, can you hear me okay and see my screen? Yes, right now? yes. Okay. So, yes. Okay, great. So, what I, I'll start by talking about tonight um, is I'll compare um, three models. And but before I start, I do just want to I want to thank the board for um, providing this opportunity for mm -hmm. us to share tonight and for um, yourselves and for the community uh, to. Uh, perhaps learn a little bit more about what school might look like. So thank you for that. And also thank you to all the parents um, who I've been talking to on the phone or through email for the past week or so with a lot of great questions. Um, keep the questions coming. They're very helpful. So what I have here, what I'm going to talk about um, tonight are um, three possible models just so that um, folks have a comparison um, between um, 
between them. So first I'm gonna talk about if, if we were in the red and we were full remote, what that might look like if we were not able to open schools. Then I'm going to talk about, um, given everything we know now, what the hybrid model would look like if we opened that way. And then finally, I'm going to talk about um, if we open in a hybrid model and some parents elected a full remote model for their child, what that might look like or, or most likely would look like given every, all the information I have. Okay, so I'll start with this, this one here is the all school full remote. So this is, this would be our plan if campus was, if we had to close campus, um, if we were ordered to close campus or we just could not open because the pandemic worsened. Um, and I'm, I am going to, forgive me, I don't wanna just read through, but I am going to really refer to this. So you'll notice there are columns here, um, curricul curriculum, delivery of instruction and schedule. And so in terms of the curriculum, obviously if we're full remote, um, it, we, we, learned about this in the spring, um, access, stu students accessing and teachers' abilities to access students. Um, it does cause us to slow down um, our delivery of instruction a little bit. So this summer, a team of Pond Cove teachers has been working on a scope and sequence for curriculum. Um, if we went into a uh, full remote situation or if we went into a hybrid situation, what basically what do we think we could teach and what would the timeline be for teaching those skills so we've been working on that there's a em strong emphasis on reading and writing and math in the hybrid model I, i'm sorry in the full remote model although um, there are would be select science and social studies standards addressed um, the full remote model would include allied arts instruction um, and there would be an emphasis on social emotional learning um, there would be daily morning meetings and also an emphasis on that throughout the day but to the best of our ability under the delivery instruction in the full remote. So students would be provided with iPads. We now have plans to be one-on-one, one-to-one -one for even kindergarten this year. Um, thank you to the tech department. Uh, Google Classroom would be utilizing a consistent platform, K to four, every teacher, every classroom um, would be using Google Classroom to deliver um, lessons and, mater and uh, instructional materials. Um, at this time, the district has chosen Zoom for uh, um, synchronous uh, interactions um, rather than Google Meet. Um, and there would be daily contact with teacher, daily morning meetings, consistent predictable schedule provided each day. Um, at the elementary level, most of the instruction would be asynchronous, so not live streaming, um, but pre-recorded um, lessons and uh, things of that nature. And we would provide um, reading and math RTI supports to students who need extra help. So, and again, there's a lot here. I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, so if we are full remote, we would, we would be delivering direct instruction remotely Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. And um, on each of those days, K2 students would be provided with um, three to four hours of learning activities per day and grades three, that would be for K to two students, and grades three to four students would receive four to five hours of learning activities a day. They would receive a schedule, um, a suggested schedule for families or caregivers or whoever's supervising the child that day that they could follow. Um, and that would include suggestions for playtime, snack time, lunch time, um, of course, like anything else, the daily instructional hours may change. We're always looking at what we're doing, um, receiving feedback from teachers and, and students and families and adjusting what we're doing. So things may change throughout the year. Wednesdays would be, as Donna mentioned, student support time, remote office hours, and then also planning and professional development for teachers. Um, again, we would provide the um, electronic devices and we would even, um, come up with a plan to safely distribute hard copy books, manipulatives, things like that early in the year for children to use throughout the year. I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about next is the hybrid model, which is um, something that we've been anticipating that, that um, the decision may be made to open under the hybrid model. So again, a lot of this is the same. The curriculum team at Pond Cove has been working on a scope and sequence for um, curriculum and assessment. Um, under the hybrid model, there would still be an emphasis on reading, writing, and math, but some science and social studies standards addressed. 
and allied arts um, would be provided um, with a combination of live and in per live in person and remote instruction. And again, that emphasis on social emotional, this would be one of the benefits of the hybrid is that we'd have students on campus some of the time. Um, the delivery of instruction, a lot of this is the same. Still iPad, students would take them home, bring them back to school. Still Google Classroom platform. <clears throat> a lot of those things are similar. <clears throat> So at Pond Cove, if we open in the hybrid model, at this time with the information we have, um, we are going based on the assumption that the school day, the school hours would be the same as they always are. Um, so that the days that students are on campus would be 8.35 to 2.55. Of course, um, with um, adjustments being needing to be made to transportation and social distancing on buses, we're not positive um, that the students would be able to arrive exactly when they usually do, but in general, the school, it would be a full school day. So students would be assigned to one of two groups, either maroon, maroon or gold, and we've been working as a district together to, um, with the middle and the high school, so that siblings throughout the district um, would be grouped in the same group, either maroon or gold, so their schedules would be consistent. Um, maroon and the maroon group would attend school on campus Monday and Thursday, and then have uh, mostly asynchronous remote instruction every Tuesday and Friday. And then the gold group would be on campus um, Tuesday and Friday and receive remote learning at home Monday and Thursday. And, and um, again, same amount of um, hours of instruction while students are at home for K2 and 3-4. Um, and Wednesdays again, student support office hours and in the morning and um, planning time and professional development for staff um, in the afternoon. And forgive me if I'm going too quickly, I'm, I'm um, certainly ready to take questions if needed after. A couple logistics, given everything, I know a lot of parents have been asking these questions. Given the information we have now in the hybrid model, the model with students um, attending school on campus two days a week, um, breakfast would be pre-ordered and served in classrooms. Lunch would be pre-ordered and served in classrooms. We would have recess. We're still working on the details of that. Um, we're going to um, create an environment where students can play safely. Um, students would remain within a specific cohort and stay with that cohort to the extent possible throughout the day to reduce um, exposure and transmission. Um, common area and hallway travel would be greatly reduced. And um, every detail, even down to dis for when students arrive at school, different grade levels would be coming in different doors. And um, so a lot of thought has gone into traffic patterns and we'll continue to work on that. So finally, in blue, this is parent elected full remote. Right, so the full remote I talked about before was if the, the, we need to close our campus. This full remote is if our campus is open, at least partially, and parents elect to full remote for their child. So it's a little different, um, but we have some information on that now. We have some data that we've been collecting, um, so we have a better sense of what that might look like. So again, um, we have that curriculum team working on that remote curriculum. Um, students would be assigned to a virtual classroom that would be taught by a Pond Cove teacher. And data right now, as of now, suggests that um, we'll be able to quite efficiently match um, students who have elected full remote with a teacher that, that um, typically does teach in that grade level. Although that's not guaranteed, depending on the, the actual data in the end, once parents have registered, some teachers may be teaching multi-age or multi-grade level classes in the full remote elected option. So that's possible. Again, it's the, all the same, students' iPads, Google Classroom, Zoom, um, very similar, just this is elected by parents. Uh, it would be the same as the, um, emer the emergency red remote. So Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, direct instruction. Wednesday, student support, teacher planning and prep. Um, one of the things that Donna had mentioned that I have down here is, you know, we would be, we plan to provide opportunities and of course it's optional, 
um, for students to come in early in the year and possibly at, a, at some sort of frequency throughout the year if, if we choose to do that and parents choose to do it, to come to campus and visit and meet their teachers and build that social connection um, live and in person. So with that, I know I just said a lot, um, and this is all information we can get out to parents as well, once the final decision is made, um, I would like to stop sharing my screen if I could, or does anyone on the board have questions and I could use this to refer or answer? And I, I can't see, uh, Laura, I can see. Laura oh. you now has raised her hand. Yes, I use my raise hand feature. Um, thank you uh, for this presentation, Jason, and I look forward to getting this information so I can just uh, digest it a little bit more. Yes, so and I apologize for going so quickly. There's so much, but I wanted to just kind of get some things out there. That's okay, so, so some of these I may have missed. So my question is if a, a parent elects for the full remote option, it looks like the daily instruction will be pre-recorded. Will there be any live instruction did i miss that yes so so what i say here what it says here in the middle column most instruction asynchronous or pre-recorded so now that is based on a few things so that and that doesn't mean that there will not be live interaction and in a full remote model um you know there would we would tend to do everything we can to provide more live um, interaction than we would in the hybrid because the students are at least getting that when they come to school for two days in the hybrid. So basically, uh, you know, there, there's, there's mixed opinions, but there's a pretty strong belief that the asynchronous and pre-recorded um, learning opportunities um, where they can be rewatched, rewound and rewatched, they can be used by parents who only have, who have weekends to go over some of this with their children that it's just more supportive of families rather than expecting families to multiple times a day consistently log in at certain times with very young children in particular. Um, so that a lot would be asynchronous. There certainly would be lots of um, effort to have live interactions with groups via Zoom um, and interact that way too, but a lot of the the, when we're addressing learning standards, there would be asynchronous opportunities for certain. Is that helpful? That, that makes, uh, yes, a lot of sense. Now, with the teachers teaching this 100% virtual elected option, would they just be teaching this? They wouldn't be also teaching another class. Right, so at this time, a lot, the, the staffing of this um, relies, the decision to make for staffing relies greatly on the number of students registered and the preliminary data we have suggests that we have, you know, full classes per grade level interested in remote. So we would have a teacher with a full caseload of 18, 20 students and this would be what they would be doing. They would be very, very busy. So, Got it. Um, you know, it's possible okay. if, if there were very, very few full remote then a teacher might do a couple different things, but we, we are seeing that there's a need for teachers to be full-time, full remote teachers for one grade level. Okay, so it depends. And then in the, um, in the uh, hybrid model, you had stated that they're gonna be with a specific cohort. So is that, do you mean their classroom or? Yes, so, so again. Broken uh, up into a smaller group. Uh, so, they'd be in their classroom in their cohort, right, in the hybrid model, 50% on campus at a time. So if there's a classroom of 20, 10 students would show up that day. And they would really be with those 10 students, their teacher, and then um, other teachers, specialists would, would, whenever possible, travel to their room or would be located close to that to that wing area so students don't, do not have too far to travel and those specialists would have adequate PPE um, and use social distancing so that we would feel comfortable with students working with, with some other staff because we need to get you know, those students connected with specialists such as guidance or social work or RTI reading or special education. So, um, but we would for the most part try to keep them potted together with that cohort to reduce exposure. 
Okay, thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. Not sure if anyone else. Okay, I've stopped sharing. And again, forgive me if that was rambling and too fast. I, um, I can answer any questions. Elizabeth looks like she has her hand raised. Go ahead, Elizabeth. Um, I just wanted to thank Jason and look forward to receiving this so I can also read it. Thanks. Okay, I don't see any other hand raised. So thank you very much for that, Jason. Let's move on to the middle school with um, Troy Eastman, our principal there. Hi. Hi. So I have asked if Donna can share my screen. I have yeah. sent her my... I'm trying to find it. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> start uh, talking. <laughs> start talking. Okay, so it's like cue the mic. Um, so largely, my, what I'm going to have to show is basically an example schedule of what a family could expect. And a hybrid, rem, hybrid, a hybrid model means that some remote and some in-person, and some people can choose to have zero in-person. That's really the only difference between the two. Um, for us at the middle school, one of the priorities was, well, there's a couple of priorities. And one was to really focus on maintaining the smallest potting of kids and limit the number of um, teachers that would work with those kids in a day. Um, so by thoughtfully scheduling them. Largely, we switched our whole middle school to two-person teams of teachers this year. Um, we were planning to go to a contact model for seventh and eighth grade. That has gone out the window because it would have caused kids to be in all kinds of different groups. So I think in another year, those would be benefits and strengths for kids. <laughs> um, but in this model, I think it's more important to have the potting and, and limit the exposure. So. Um, so with that said, we, in a typical, what you'll see in a minute is a copy of my, of a schedule. So what you have here is in the yellow, it says CMS hybrid model, um, choice of hundred percent remote. So that's on the left side and 50% um, remote, which is on the right. So in a hybrid model, it was important for us to make sure that everything was equitable and not to um, inadvertently or purposely incentivize one method over another because I think it should be a parent's choice without um, any negative consequences to their choices. So our goal was, how do we make it all equitable? So um, for example, in the left column, if you chose in a hybrid model to be remote, you'd see this is, for, this is an example of one schedule. It doesn't mean everybody's schedule would go in that order, obviously. You know, it might say language arts first. It might say something else. But this is just a quick example. Um, so a maroon hybrid model, and, and someone chose to be 100% remote in the hybrid model. And on um, two days a week, they would have math, science, language arts, lunch, break, social studies, world language, and win slash advisory. And I'll get into that in a minute. Um, now, typically, we would also have allied arts figured in there, so we'd have a seven block schedule. We have reduced that as an attempt to limit some of the potting and reshuffling of kids to a six block schedule. Um, so this, well, with, win and, with the win advisory. Um, so that would be a day that student, that would be a typical day. Now, if you look to the right, you would see that the kids' peers that chose to be in school would have the same type of schedule going on. So no advantage or disadvantage to being remote or not remote. Um, it's the same exact times. Um, the expectations are the same. It would be the same, except for where you received your education. Now, on the other days, so Monday, Thursday, for example, this maroon designation would happen. Um, on Tuesday, and it would be, I will call them the core content classes, so to speak, all in one day. And then on the other days, um, so when it would be gold for that group, that would be their um, remote portion, obviously for the remote, but you'll see it's the same for the in-person choice. Um, a remote day will look the same for everyone in that aspect of their, of their off day. So it's going to consist of um, the core content, having extensions, homework, research, reading, some of that guided independent practice. And we are trying to limit that to 30 minutes per class. So for about two and a half hours maximum worth of work a student could have on, um, the, on what I'm going to call the off day from their core content. Now also, there is no expectation in that for the teachers to have direct contact or do 
um, lead groups for that. And the rationale is because the teachers are teaching the other group in class that day. Um, so it's really important for us to try and not have our teachers live in both worlds, trying to teach in class and then at the same time teaching remotely. Um, I think that would be a real challenge for them. So there will be one group of teachers that will be a rem dedicated to remote learning. Now, as Jason said, if we had um, a large number of families decide for remote learning, then that would change and we may, and we would have to add more teachers to that side of, of the equation. Um, so that could possibly grow. And then the part that I think is really helpful is allied arts is really the in-person direct contact for people on the, on the, in the, on the example on the left. So on a gold day, uh, the Tuesdays and Fridays, the people that would be reaching into your home and contacting your, your students would be your allied arts teachers. Um, and largely that is some art, phys ed, music, um, and library. So those classes like that would be the ones um, to do that. We're thinking about combining our phys ed and health. That's a good example of trying to combine some, some courses to limit some of the interactions. Um, so allied arts would be the, the people that you would be in contact with on that, the, that day. So again, on the, the column on the right, oh my, you know, this family has chosen to have their kid in school for half of the time in a remote, in a hybrid model. So they will come to school, they'll go to math, they'll go to science, language arts. I say they go to it, largely the teachers are coming to them, um, not asking kids to move. And then the next day they will be remote and they would have their core content up to two and a half hours of, of work to do and an allied art schedule. Now we just have that in there as a placeholder right now because we're working with them to try to maximize what would be the best allied art schedule for them and how can we provide that. So that's why right now that's just a placeholder. So largely the additional information, which I can read most of it, it says, um, and this, these were some of the, the parts that really went into, into this scheduling and the idea. Students will have at, uh, equal access. And I can't quite see it, Donna, but you may, if you can shrink it or move it to the left a little bit, that would be great. Um, I don't, I don't know, but no, I can only see about half of each of those sentences. The numbers, the bullets. That's pretty good. I'll just hold the screen closer. Um, so it says uh, students will have access to all the classes in either model. Some things that will be different this year, and I know Donna touched on it a little bit. Um, last year in the emergency remote, we were very flexible with things like grading and attendance and all of that stuff. Um, and we've really listened to the feedback from families and teachers as we've tried to plan at the middle school. What is it that we need to do differently for this? And a lot, some of it is accountability for, for students and parents. So things like attendance will be taken at the beginning of each class, um, especially in the remote setting. Obviously, if you're there in person, we can see you, but in a remote setting. Um, all classes will be graded. Teachers will utilize, utilize Google Classroom as their communication platform. Um, every student will be assigned an advisor as a family contact. So last year, there was a lot of frustration around, I'm having eight different teachers Skype into my house and trying, me trying to communicate with them on a regular basis as a parent or a student, and it was overwhelming. And that, again, is part of the rationale behind having only the allied arts group um, on the remote days um, for the in-person people as well. And the advisor becomes that contact person, where if you're not understanding something, if things are not going really well, it's just another layer, because I know our teachers were feeling last year, it's very challenging to try to have a Zoom or um, a Google meeting with, 25 students, you can't see them all on your screen. It's hard to give them all your attention and your time. And it was really hard to make sure they weren't falling through the cracks. So one kind of level, you know, a, a net under that is the addition of an advisory program where the advisors will be checking in. And, and we have a whole nother plan working on what is the role of an advisor in that. So that's coming out later. Um, but that made the teachers feel really good because now they're really focusing on about 10 kids not falling through the cracks and not 35 and every student has somebody advocating for them in there and a parent has a contact. So that is new and we're pretty excited about that. Um, attendance and grades will be tracked in power school. Remote lessons will consist of live and guided practice. So it could be some synchronous and some asynchronous um, types of learning going on. And then all students will have access to social and emotional support. Again, it's really important to us that no matter what method or model you choose, you ha have equal access to all of these um, things. All students will be able to participate in clubs, activities, or sports that are offered. So 
I have no idea what's going to be offered, but in the event that it was, it's really important that we're not, again, incentivizing someone to make a choice. Oh, I need to send my kid to school if they want to play this sport. That, that can't be a part of this equation, in my opinion. I think it needs to be equitable. Um, and then video conferencing this year will be via Zoom. And the highlight really is the only difference between the hybrid remote and the hybrid in person is the location um, that you'll be receiving your instruction. So that has been our focus and our goal all along. It's also to limit the really focus on pod sizes. It's pretty amazing. I walked through the school the other day with um, Jill Young, our nurse, and just trying to figure out how wide are our hallways? Does this need to be a one way traffic hallway? And if it is, how do we do that in a way that allows the traffic flow to even happen in the building? So there's so many logistics, it's really important that we keep our pods of students small. Um, and most cases, for example, on these schedules, fifth, sixth, maybe most seventh and eighth graders would have the same math and science teacher. So it'd be one person. Language arts and social studies would be one person. And world language would be one person. So right there, they only have three interactions with teachers on those days. There are some outliers there of having math off team. If, if I'm in sixth grade and I need an algebra class, it's not obviously offered in sixth grade. So that student would have to either, maybe we'll try to remotely get it to that student. So it would stop them from walking and going into joining another class um, or they would have to join that other class. So those would be the only situations really that we could see students having more than three teachers in a day. So that is, I think we feel really successful with that. And then lastly, we believe that if we were to go red, full remote for everyone, we would go with the same schedule. Um, and the potting is equally important if students are at home because the teachers, I think, are less effective working with 25 kids remotely than they would be groups of 15 or 12. It's really gonna be 12. Um, so our, our pod sizes are 12 people in a room counting the teacher. And that kind of is the mathematical formula of, you know, according to the space that we can have in a room at a time. It's about 11 students and one adult. We can get that much into our rooms, um, moving some stuff out. So even it, our goal was create a schedule that we can keep for the long haul, that can fluctuate between hybrid remote or full remote and, not, and still honor all the concerns that parents had last year with, with our remote learning and kind of meet our teachers needs as well at the same time. So that really is our goal. We have curriculum groups working. Kathy's working with one of them. You know, she's helping us with that. But really it's about identifying, as Jason said, scope and sequence. You know, what are we teaching in the first month? First month? What skills are the important ones that we're gonna prioritize? How are we doing that? So that's happening. Um, we do have a remote learning committee that is meeting, um, working on setting really some training. And, and I think some of the really important parts for us are going to be the ability to have the roll in two weeks. So in my mind, we would have something like fifth and seventh graders come. So one day would be fifth grade and seventh grade maroon. The next day would be fifth and seventh gold. The next time we met would be five, seven maroon, five, seven gold. So they would have a lot of time in there to learn. How are we entering the building? Because we're using five different entrances this year to separate kids. Um, what are the protocols that we have to go through for safety, health and safety? How are we gonna get our lunch? What are we doing with all these things? That really is the value of the roll-in and then kind of a tech boot camp mixed in with that because every student in the hybrid model is gonna to have to do some level of remote learning at the same time. So we need to make sure that we really give them the appropriate training um, beforehand and front loading as to how do I log on to PowerSchool? How do I attach something to Zoom? You know, how do I manage my Google Classrooms? And, and really teaching those skills to them is the purpose of that first two week, kind of the slower roll in and really give our, all of our systems kind of a stress test at a smaller level. You know, how's busing gonna go? How is the entrance, how's the entrance working? What are the trips to the nurse's office? And all of these types of things, we just wanna put it in a smaller group in a smaller setting and make our kids feel really comfortable with that. Um, and then also anyone that is choosing remote, I think it's really important we offer. Not everybody has to choose to take up us on the offer, but a day, and it would probably be that Wednesdays of the roll-in is what I'm thinking, where they could come in and meet some of the teachers. They're gonna have to pick up the devices anyways um, and really get some of that techie kind of boot camp stuff for themselves as well, just to kind of front load their remote learning experience. So that's kind of in a nutshell what we have planned out 
and it's about access, safety, potting, and, and all of that. So I hope that's relatively clear enough for you. And, I, and it, we do have our students broken down into maroon and gold already. However, as Donna said, depending on the survey, what if one classroom that's scheduled to have 12 people in it all of a sudden has nine that are gonna choose the remote option, we need to do some reshuffling. Um, so we're not quite ready to share that yet for that reason. So any questions? Heather, you're muted. <laughs> That's what you just said to me, huh, Elizabeth? That I was muted. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, this is for the board to be asking questions. This time is not for um, community members to ask. And I do see that Hope Straw has her, Hope has her hand raised. So go ahead, Hope. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Uh, so, Troy, thank you very much. That was very helpful. I have a couple questions that you, which you may have answered, but I just want to sort of crystallize it. Um, it sounds like uh, we've sort of created this model where yellow, um, we could go from yellow to red, and it really, all, it, all that means is the, the kids who are going in person go all remote, but the kids who had chosen, opted out, would just continue as as typical so yes absolutely that was our goal was to have the least disruption in this turbulent time of not knowing what's coming next mm -hmm. uh, so that we can not have to restart reshuffle change things very much um and then so you mentioned that the if you're choosing all remote and you're um you're on your instruction day you'd have a you'd have some live and some asynchronous instruction uh, I, di I didn't catch, would it be the same teacher for those so, students? Yeah, so in a perfect, awesome world, we would just video every classroom and send it out. We are not there at the middle school with our tech ability or I, I think even our, our professional development to expect that to happen. So no, at first it would become its own um, uh, remote learning team of teachers and they would only be teaching remotely. So I think, in my expectation would be in that situation, they would develop that skill set maybe quicker um, because they, that would be their primary focus. So I wanna hesitate of saying, yes, it would be live instruction, but that would be the goal of doing it. And that's kind of the, as we start to decide how many in, teachers we need and which teachers, some teachers prefer the same thing. They also would prefer to be remote. So where possible, if I could match them up, that would be great for everyone. Um, but I'm not naive enough to believe that that's going to work out well. So um, we have some identified people already that would be providing this, this instruction. Um, and depending on how many kids and families request remote, that we may do a 5-7 remote team, a 7-8. We may do a, you know, multiple groups at, every, at a grade level. Um, so it's really dependent upon that survey that we're going to get back. Okay, thank you. Are there other comments or questions from board members? I'm not seeing any hands, so if there are, you can um, speak up. But in the spirit of keeping things moving, thank you very much for that, Troy. Let's move to our high school principal, Jeff Shedd. Hi, good evening. Um, <clears throat> thanks for the opportunity. Um, Donna or Jen, if you could make me a co-host, I'm not gonna share anything yet, but I will be in, in a little bit. Um, so, okay, thank you. So you'll be hearing um, as I sort of go through what high school is planning on for, um, our fall instruction, we'll be hearing some common threads between what, with what Jason and Troy have said about Pond Cove in the middle school. You'll also hear some differences that really don't reflect any philosophical differences, it's just the realities that at high school, um, teaching assignment is more by experience and certification and training and specialty and that sort of thing. So it's not 
the, the experience will have common threads, but it won't be exactly the same. Um, so I want to talk about three things, and one is the work of the fall planning committee uh, for the high school um, with an emphasis, uh, as Jason and Troy did, talking about the schedule and what that would look like. Um, I want to talk about physical spacing issues, um, and then I want to conclude um, with some comments about instruction, um, and particularly what instruction could look like for students who are at home, either on the off, on the the days when they're not in school, if they're participating in the hybrid model, if that's what we choose to do, or if they're home because they've opted for 100% remote learning. So that's sort of my game plan about what I'd like to cover. Um, and first, I would just like to thank uh, the members of the Fall Planning Committee. We've met either six or seven times so far, and I expect we're going to be meeting at least three times more. Uh, between now and the beginning of school, and I just wanted to quickly rattle off their names if the board would indulge me. Um, Andrew Lupian, Kathy Bach, Liz Yerrington, these are all teachers. Karen, Karen Jenkins, our school nurse. Ted Jordan, a teacher, social worker. Joyce Nato, Christine Marshall, A.G. Gillis, who's one of our special education ed techs. Um, David Peary, and then Nate Carpenter, the assistant principal. So we've talked about an, quite a few issues um, on the team. We started talking about bottleneck issues, um, which led to some interesting discussions about how to sort of minimize the likelihood of bottlenecks. I'm not going to address that tonight. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer it. Uh, we've talked a little bit about ventilation. I know Perry's going to talk about that today. At our last meeting, we started talking about study halls and lunches and what those would look like um, in the fall. But without any question, the biggest topic that we've talked about is the schedule. Um, and over the course of all the meetings that we had, I think we developed about seven different alternative schedules um, that we could possibly use. Um, and then after sort of generating a lot of I great ideas, um, we took one, one meeting and we sat back and we said, what are the criteria that we're going to use to judge what the best schedule is for, uh, for particularly a, a hybrid model? Uh, but really for the fall, given the fact that the fall could look like any number of different things, and it could look like one thing on one week and something else two weeks later. Um, so we ended up generating a list of about 12 possible criteria and then prioritizing those criteria. Um, and and the, the non-negotiables I will start with in terms of any schedule that we dealt with that we accepted that we needed to work with is number one, compatibility with paths. Um, because PATHS is planning to be open this fall. Um, to the extent the Portland school system is open at all, they plan to have kids um, in smaller groups come to PATHS and benefit from what they have to offer. And the second thing really is, and this applies to grouping, uh, primarily is uh, working together with Pond Cove in the middle school to make sure that we're staying in sync and being sensitive to the needs of families who have, who have students in different schools. Um, so after a discussion, we prioritized the sort of the non-negotiables as the number one far and away top thing. Um, and it sounds very trite to say it, but it really drew, the realization really drove a lot of thinking and changed a lot of thinking. Um, and that was health and safety. Um, and not that, not that we weren't mindful of that before, but sort of going through the process that led us to say that's the number one thing really did open up some eyes to some really sort of different ways to think about our school schedule. Um, and that really, those health and safety issues um, um, meant trying to minimize transitions as much as possible and trying to minimize the number of students who pass through any given space in the high school for any particular sequence of time, period of time. Um, so that, that was by far number one, and that, that definitely drove the schedule that I'm going to share with you in a couple minutes. Um, the other one, and, and Troy mentioned this as well, is that whatever schedule we adopt, knowing that this could be a very interesting year with some interesting transitions, um, is adaptable to any any model, whether we're hybrid, whether we're remote, whether you're 100% remote, um, or whether we're all in school, um, we wanted to have a schedule that would have the advantage of being able to easily be able to adapt to any one of those modes. And a related 
criteria, which was I think the third top criteria, is that a schedule that would be simple and manageable for both students and staff. Um, and that really tied in nicely with some of the health and safety concerns as well. Um, and so, oh, and the last one that I'll mention, I think it was, it was right up there, was a schedule that would be conducive to building effective relationships with kids. One of the things that I'm sure teachers in all three buildings are concerned about um, is that we did have the advantage during the remote learning in the spring is that our teachers already had established relationships with students. Um, that's not going to be true when we start up in the fall, except coincidentally, if a teacher happens to have a repeat student, and that will happen in some cases, but it will not be true in the majority of cases. Um, so that led to some interesting conversations about what kind of schedule is most conducive to developing meaningful relationships with kids in the limited in in a smaller amount of time than you would have with less frequency of contact than you would have if we started the school entirely in person so now i will sh so the schedule that we have come up with it's it's not 100 percent finalized there's one big part of it that's to be determined but it's going to be determined within the next day or two i would say is what we've come to refer to as an alternating mini term shortened block schedule i'm going to say that again an alternating mini term shortened block schedule it's a lot of words but it's a fairly simple concept and let me see if i can get it up uh, share screen there it is it's not allowing me to share donna Oh, well, it, it should. You're a co-host. Yeah. Mm. Did you go down to the green share screen? And then you have to share it. You have to press share again once you pull it up. That's what I do and it's... It's over in the lower right hand corner then, the second. Make sure that the screen that your desktop is highlighted. Yep, it is. And I've pressed here again, and it says I have to open system preferences. Interesting. I wonder, let me take, make somebody else. That's interesting. Um, I could, I could send this, I could share this with you, Donna, if you want to. Why don't you share it with Jen? <laughs> yeah. I, she can do it faster. <laughs> I will share it with Jen. Uh, hold on a second. Are you going to email it to me real quick or? That's what I'm going to do, Jen. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I can do that. How's it going, Jen? I just, I just keep hitting refresh. <laughs> I haven't gotten it to you, Jen. It's been okay, on. okay. <laughs> it's not, you, it's not on you. It's on me. Okay. I keep hitting mute because my dog is barking upstairs with my child. So. All right, I'm gonna, I guess I'll share it from Excel.
Is it worth? Um, I'm not even allowed to attach a file right now. I'm really confused. Is it worth moving on to uh, our business manager for the sake of time and coming back to you, Jeff? That's perfectly fine with me, Heather. If I can't figure out in that amount of time, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> Jen, here's, here's a trick question. Do you think you can, um, am I able to share my screen? <laughs> Yeah, you should be able to. Okay. Um, All right. Here we go. I think we're good. Um, okay. So my screen should be up. I just wanted to highlight our new funding sources that are on all of our minds right now in our district. The first timeline we have here is our new CRF Coronavirus Relief Fund. And that's this one right here. We were just awarded the $1,052,760.36 exactly. And the trick with this funding source is that all funds must be encumbered by September 30th. And we have until December 30th of this year to spend the money. So that's the first set of funding we have. The second set we have this little amount, CARES, ESSERF, Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief Fund money of $23,098.80. And we have until September of 2022 to spend these funds. I don't think we'll have any problem with that this year. So the administrative team has been putting together data um, for this funding application of the $1 million that would uh, suit both the hybrid and the distance learning needs. And we, are, we have until the end of this month to submit the application. The money has been approved. So now they just want to see our plan. And um, then we will have it reimbursed, if be like a reimbursable type funding source. So I just wanted to highlight that. And, that's all I have, Donna, unless you want me to touch on anything else. No, I think we're all set. Thank okay. you, Marcy. Welcome. Thank you, Marcy. Welcome. Jeff, do you think you're ready to go back? Or should we see how Kathy Stankard, she why has to present. Why don't we hear from Kathy? Okay. Our Director of Teaching and Learning, Kathy Stankert. Kathy, are you there? I see her. I see her. And she's not muted. And she's a co-host. Kathy, are you? We can't hear you. Kathy? You're shaking your head. It's not working for you to unmute. It's not working. Okay, um, Jen, are you able to unmute Kathy? Yeah, uh, yeah, I can. I mean, I can unmute her. Um, I just did. But she's talking and we can't hear her. Does she have her buds in? Sometimes her buds do weird things. I know the air buds do weird things. No. Right. Here, so here's something I've done. My, the volume on my computer, the microphone is way down. Have you checked to make sure it's on and up? Yes. I just read your lips. But I can't do that for the whole presentation. I don't have that skill. Why don't we go on and maybe she can work on that. Yep. Uh, we'll move on to Del Pedi, our Director of Special Services. All right. Good evening, everyone. 
I just want to do a brief overview now that you've heard from the different schools and what the hybrid model looks like um, for general education students. How would it, what would it look like for our special education students? Um, can every, are you hearing me all right, Heather? Yes. No. Um, so essentially our teachers, I mean, the other piece that I do need to mention at the beginning, as Troy said, we're still collecting numbers, names and numbers of students that will be going 100% remote. And, uh, and as Donna mentioned earlier, we also have staff members that will be matched up to work remotely as well. But generally, so I'll speak in general terms that, um, in the sense that um, folks that would be in person. Um, so our special education teachers are gonna be expected to flex in and out of um, in-person and remote learning throughout their days. They're gonna set up their schedules with the students on their caseloads and they may have to go, they may go from any given day where they're uh, servicing two students, two or three students uh, in person to possibly two students, one being a, on a non-cohort and the other being 100% remote learning. So it's, again, this will set, set them up so that if we end up, you know, going to 100% remote learning, they're just going to carry that schedule right with them and follow it just the same way. It's just what format they're using to meet student needs. And of course, the student needs are all driven by the hours on their IEPs or their individual education plans. Um, and this would be the same for related services. Uh, some related services are more difficult to do remotely and less effective. So we would, of course, try to get those done in person on in-person days with regard to the hybrid model. Um, but we also have some staff that are part-time. So there may be a combination of uh, in-person and hybrid for any particular student. Uh, other things that I wanted to mention, um, IEP meetings, because of the six foot social distancing for adults and the fact that adult to adult transmission is the biggest concern at, the, at this moment, all of our IEP meetings would continue using a virtual format, format uh, Zoom. Uh, testing, um, so as most of you know, a lot of special education is driven on standardized testing, standardized uh, tests, Standardized tests are not standardized to be administered, administered uh, remotely. And so a lot of that was put on hold in the spring. We have had some testing done this summer, but we are still behind. So we will be working on that backlog as, um, as we progress into the fall. And that also, also will uh, mean a lot of IEP meetings at all three schools. Uh, PPE, I just wanted to mention that Outside of what Donna mentioned that the state is providing us, I have uh, ordered plexiglass barriers uh, for our staff because obviously three uh, adults are still supposed to be six feet from students and uh, to provide direct intervention, you will have to be closer than that. And if you've ever been in a resource room uh, watching a teacher work with a student, they are much closer than that. So we will need additional PPE so that we're actually in uh, physical proximity so that we can be effective. And as well as uh, also the Z shields for them. Z shields are uh, just a little bit different than the head shields in that they, go, they rest on your chest, they go around your neck and they rest on your chest and they're much more comfortable uh, given that you may have to wear them all day long. I believe that the gowns are coming, get, some of the gowns will be coming with um, the state order. Donna, I'm not sure on that one, but uh, that at times like our speech therapists may need gowns. Uh, folks that work in life skills may need gowns at times. Um, I also wanted to mention that once we have students back in person, that we will be doing progress monitoring or informal assessments to figure out where the students are at and with regard to all of the goal areas that are listed on their IEPs. Uh, the other piece is the social emotional. 
So we have pulled together a committee that meets for the first time next week. The committee consists of all the guidance counselors, uh, social workers, the psychologists, and the uh, behavior specialists. And so we'll be meeting to figure out what makes the most sense for our returning students. And um, they'll, those, are, those are our experts in the field and we'll kind of leave that up. Kathy and I will both be on that committee to facilitate. Um, I also wanted to mention that for those students that based on the data that was collected in the spring, were unable to benefit in any meaningful way from the remote learning, that we will be doing our best to bring those students in in person on all in-person instructional days. And that'll be, uh, that'll be decided on an individual student by student basis with the treatment teams at each school. And I think that's all I had to share, uh, unless uh, board members have questions. Heather, can I just talk for one moment? Yes, Jen. Okay, sorry, I don't know why, but my, I couldn't raise my hand. I was just gonna comment, Dell, on um, the gowns and all of the PPE through the main department of education through the state. The inventory has been slowly trickling in. I get email notifications when that happens and I've been ordering accordingly, so, and they're on the list. Oh, thank you. Yep. Thank you for that update. Any board members have questions? Okay. Um, thank you, Dell. We're gonna go back to Jeff Shedd. Um, I hear that he's ready. I believe I am. Um, I think at some point in the recent past, I must have clicked something in system preferences that I, I, I should okay. have addressed. Um, so anyway, thank you, Jen, for um, helping me out with this. So this is, uh, I mentioned a CEHS alternate, alternating mini term schedule for 2020 to 21. Um, and this is essentially what it looks like. And um, the comment, so basically what it would be is that we envision having um, half of our classes meet over what we are calling a mini term of either four weeks or eight weeks. So that let's, I'm, I think that the likelihood is we're going to end up at four weeks. So that for four weeks, our students would take periods, the classes that they have during periods one, four, seven, and eight. Um, we think that the advantages of that, and then the next four weeks, they would take the other classes, two, three, five, six, and then they would continue alternating this way as long as um, we, for as long as they need to, um, based on what the guidelines are and what COVID-19 is doing and that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's a schedule that we feel comfortable. We could easily adapt to completely remote learning and we could also easily adapt and continue in completely in-person learning. Um, so that is basically the concept. The advantages that we see that it has are a couple fold. Um, and the first one is health and safety. Um, we are concerned about, ha about minimizing the number of students who will be passing through the classrooms, both for the sake of the students and for the sake of the teachers. Um, and so this would essentially cut in half the number of students who are going through a particular classroom for any sort of stretch, significant stretch of time. Um, it also, we think is, although there is some difference of opinion, but the, I think there's consensus is, and certainly the fall planning committee members felt that it's a stronger schedule for us in terms of building relationships because every student will be in school meeting with their, let's say, English teacher twice a week. Um, if we were to try to create a schedule where kids were meeting with all of their eight period classes and all of their eight te teachers, then it would mean they would only be meeting in person live in class once per week. Um, so we think this is a lot more conducive to um, 
to building relationships as well, since we'll be starting off the year without those relationships. There are other advantages as well um, for both students and teachers, um, and for students particularly, um, if we all of a sudden were to scoot into remote learning, the advantage of this um, is that students would not need to be having to manage all of their high school classes at once. They would be able to focus on a smaller number of classes for a more, in a more intensive way over a more extended period of time. Um, there are two, two sort of issues with, with this system, and one is that there will be, each time a new mini term begins, there'll be a sort of getting caught up back to where students were when last they were with that particular teacher. Um, but we actually think that, but, but the, on the other side, um, students, because they're able to focus on fewer classes, should be able to master in more depth and have more experience practicing, so hopefully retention will be greater. We're also thinking about if, if there's a way during the four weeks that a class is essentially off, whether periodically during those four weeks, there can be some limited occasions of contact between the teacher and the student. Um, the other problem that needs to be resolved is, is in the realm of special education, just to make sure that we can um, coordinate this with the needs of the students under IEPs uh, who are, um, who are entitled to get a certain number of minutes of support over given periods of time. Um, but actually the special educators in the building, special education teachers have been pretty strong that they think that this model actually is better for most of their kids uh, be precisely because it allows them to focus on fewer things at once. Um, they don't have to juggle quite as much. Um, and, and they believe and you'll notice also that the end of each day, similar to I think what Troy showed for the middle school, the last hour of each day is an office hours, student work and support time, which is time when either remote or in-person students can get connection with teachers. Um, and then Friday is on Wednesday as well, um, the entire morning is a time when students can get remote support from teachers. Again, both students who are participating in hybrid learning and students who are participating strictly at home. So that is another opportunity to provide support for students. So this is a little bit of a different schedule. And when we first started talking about it, it seemed so untraditional that it, it, it seemed like it couldn't possibly be a good idea. Uh, but as we processed it more and more and more, we think we've, we're, we're pretty confident that the advantages of this significantly outweigh the disadvantages, and particularly when it comes to health and safety, uh, primarily because of that issue of reducing the number of times, um, number of students who are going through any given classroom space over any sequence of time. It also reduces the number of transition times that we have for students as well, because the classes are longer than they would be even in our regular school schedule. Uh, this provides for hour-long classes, which is, which is longer than we normally have. Um, so that's the schedule. I'm sure there may be questions, particularly since this is the first time you've, people have seen it. Uh, administrators have heard about it, but um, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. I did want to talk about physical spacing a little bit within the classrooms. Um, so the typical high school classroom um, has between 750 and 850 square feet. There are some that are a little bit more, um, but that's the typical high school classroom. Um, based on even social distancing guidelines of six feet, um, that amount of square footage should be, give us the opportunity to have 10 to 12 people in a classroom at one time. Um, and this obviously assumes different classes have tables, science classes have lab tables, so it is more complex. Not every classroom is the generic sort of uh, classroom with some, with some, with, with some uh, teacher's desk and, and bookcases and, and, and shelving and that sort of thing. But, but in general, that's the size. So um, I'll throw some data at you that's very familiar to me right now because it's what I've been working on for the last few days, which has to do with the maroon gold division of students within the high school, which is now done. Um, so there are essentially 253 regular education classes that will be meeting during the first semester of our fall semester. 
Um, some of those are year long classes, a good number are, some of those are first semester classes. Um, so there are 253 gold groups of students and 253 maroon groups of students. 90.5% of the maroon groups are um, less than or equal to 10 students. 89% um, of the gold groups are less than or equal to 10 students. Um, so we feel com th then there are a few classes that no matter how much you want to do it, they are, they are just large classes. So we do anticipate there may need, there will need to be some classes that are taught in um, more creatively used spaces. I think Donna alluded to this earlier in her remarks, the cafeteria, the auditorium, possibly the achievement center, possibly the robotics room if we have to use that room. Um, so there are spaces we anticipate where sometimes teachers will be teaching in spaces other than their regular classroom settings in the interest of sort of physical distancing and the health and safety of students and staff. Um, so I wanna talk about instruction. Um, that's sort of the physical distancing, the physical environment of the classes. Um, in terms of instruction, um, we will have a certain number of teachers who are remote, 100% remote teachers based on, their, based on their own situation. We will have a certain number of students who are 100% remote learners, just as with the other principals, the other schools. I don't have final numbers of either yet. They are coming in. Um, but I will say, unlike the other two schools, um, in high school, teachers tend to be more content specialists and they, they're, what they are able to teach is limited by their certification. So, it, so we do not, and, and I, it's just really given that reality not feasible to set up a certain group of teachers and say they are going to teach the wide array of classes that students who are being taught 100% remote would, would want to access and have the, and, and have the right to access. Um, so we're not going to try to do that because it's just, it's just not going to work. So, so families who elect to have their students taught 100% remotely at home, those students will be the part, part of their regular classes. Um, they will have the regularly assigned teachers. Um, the only difference is they will not be coming into the building. They will be accessing those classes from home remotely. Um, so, so that is really one of the knowns that we absolutely have. The other known so is that all kids will be in their regularly scheduled classes with their regularly scheduled teachers, regardless of whether they're 100% accessing things remotely or they're accessing some things in class and some things remotely. Um, the other thing that is a known is that all students um, will have live contact and instruction from teachers. Um, that, that is absolutely a known that that will take place. Um, the the $100,000 question um, is whether or not we can pull off having teachers concurrently teaching students, half of whom are in class and half of whom, and maybe a little bit more, are at home remotely. Um, one of the huge, and because it would be ideal if it could work. Um, two months ago, I thought it would, I'm, I'm surprised I'm even saying that I think it's something that we need to explore. And I think it's something that's worth exploring. There are models out there for doing that sort of uh, concurrent hybrid, concurrent in-person and remote teaching. Um, they are challenging. They would require training. They have some technological questions that we need to answer. Um, and one of the great advantages of having the second week of professional development for teachers before school begins, so not starting students in school until the 8th, and then having those two weeks for a sort of working time as we orient and train students and, and continue to orient and train teachers, is that we can try out some of these things. Um, at the very least, students, teachers will be able to record classes, post the classes so that students at home can access them. And they would be also having opportunities to live connect with their teachers to get support. At the very least, that will happen. Um, if we can pull off concurrent live teaching of students in class and remotely, we are going to make our best efforts to do that as well. But we have some questions that we have to answer 
So I, I don't want to promise that we can pull it off, uh, but, I, but I, I think we will invest time and energy to see if we can make it work, particularly for the benefit of those students who are going to be 100% remote. Um, we, we really have to tackle it um, and make every effort to see if we can do that. And I think that, I think that that is all, unless there are any questions, and I'm sure that there are. I did see that Nasser had his hand up a little while ago. Um, Nasser, if you still have a question. Uh, yeah. Hi, Jeff. Um, I like your schedule, and it's a little easier for me to follow, but I have to say that your naming is a little difficult to say or to follow. Uh, the naming and the title, mini, mini, mini something. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, Sorry. Uh, we'll work on that. All right, great. Uh, this schedule looks great. Um, and then my question is, do individuals have choice? Like if I show this to my son, Hamza, he's gonna, go, he's gonna say, oh, I wanna be in the gold group because this way he gets a four day weekend. And my work that I work in the, in the, in the city of Portland, we had a further day and it was something similar. So one week I'll get Thursday off, the other week I will get uh, Friday off. So we can equally uh, get a uh, chance of having the long, long day weekend. So the question is, is this a choice by students or first come serve, or how is this gonna be worked out? So, so I, I think if you ask Jason and Troy the same question, they would all tell you the same thing. There will not be any choice. Um, there, just, there just can't be because we have to have roughly equal numbers of students um, in overall in the cohorts, Nasser. Um, and within each class, we have to have as, as close to an even balance of between Gold and Rune as we possibly can. And on top of that, um, there are many families, I think there's about 150 families of students in the high school who also have students in the middle school or Pond Cove. Um, so, so we are assigning those at all three, at all three schools now, sir. Um, there will not be choice about that, no. Elizabeth. Thank you and thank you, Jeff. Um, to, I had my own questions, but just to follow up a little bit on what Nasser said, um, if you are in the gold group, my understanding is that Friday would not be a day off anyway. Am I correct that you would be expected are, to learn on Friday as well? There are, there are five days of school. Um, and definitely Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday are, are complete school days. It's just a question of how you're accessing school, um, not whether you're accessing school. And even Wednesday morning in particular, there will be a lot of contacts between teachers and students as well. So Thanks. yeah. This, this is a so, five-day schedule. Yeah, I, that was my understanding. So my question for the days that um, a student might be um, accessing school from home, it's their home day. Well, have you worked out quite yet that there will be, you know, there's a lot of talk of synchronous and asynchronous to me. That means Zoom meetings versus videos. So um, will there be Zoom meetings or video, like how, how is that supposed to work at the high school? Because it, there was definitely a, a great disparity in how teachers interacted with students last spring. And um, I was hoping for some norms and expectations that um, if, you know, on remote days, whether during the hybrid situation or in a 100% situation, that there would be a, a higher level of um, Zoom interactions where there was actual teaching content. So if, if you're in, let's say, for example, Elizabeth, if you're in the Maroon group and you're at home on Tuesdays, um, and, I, and I tried to explain this, but um, one of two things is going to happen. One is because the teachers are going to be teaching their classes in school. Um, so, they, so either students will be accessing um, some learning asynchronously which the teachers would be would be providing on those days or my hope is that we can work out the 
the issues associated with actually having this, the, the remote, the students who are at home access the live instruction in the classroom. Um, again, I, I, I'm not promising that, um, but that is the hope um, if we, if we can, can pull that off. Um, and there are definitely some models that allow you to do that without super sophisticated technology, um, really with Zoom, uh, essentially. But there are questions about bandwidth and there are other questions about other aspects of just getting, having, helping teachers, including uh, sort of get used to think differently about what classes can look like, essentially. Um, I do think that Zoom, the, the decision to go to Zoom um, as opposed to Meet has the potential to be very beneficial in terms of this direction because Zoom does have the ability to do breakout rooms um, and it is not impossible to have breakout rooms that include students who are, some of whom are in the classroom and some of whom are at home or breakout rooms that are either kids in the classroom or kids, kids at various locations at home remotely, but essentially doing exactly the same thing. Thanks, and I, I know you did touch on it and I just kind of wanted to highlight it a little bit and I appreciate you going into a little bit more depth. Um, and please don't take this the wrong way. I'm, I'm going to ask some challenging things and it is completely with respect, but um, how can we possibly deliver the appropriate amount of content with appropriate instruction with essentially um, we're taking half the school year away from the students in this scenario of um, mini terms. If someone is taking pre calculus for four weeks and then and they're going from 50 minute periods to 60 minute periods, which is great, but it's a 10 minute increase and only twice a week in the school day. So for four weeks and then you have four weeks off from pre-calculus, I, I, that's half the time that you're able to deliver instruction. And I guess my concern is around, you know, we've got, we've got AP classes and exams that don't have, you know, modified content that we know of. There was modified, you know, uh, content and expectations for last year, but we haven't heard anything about that this year. And I don't imagine they will. But even still, our, our, our standards aren't aligned to AP classes. It, it, it just looks like that we've got stripped down to half as far as what kind of access and content we can deliver, or are we going to be asking the students to double the amount of time that they teach themselves? So I would say that um, you're asking an excellent question, but I'm not sure it's one, I, I don't think it's unique to a mini term model. I think that we'd have the same question um, if we were to try to teach all eight classes at once, um, because essentially it, it, it's just a different reorganization of the time, because if we did try to teach all eight classes at once, then students would have half the opportunities to be in school with teachers that they would under this model. Um, so it really, it's not so much the mini term model that is that it's it, it's it's really that we're in a hybrid situation. Um, if now I will say that um, the periods in this model are longer than the periods in our regular school situation. Um, the other issue is, and again, it's it's that we have taken Wednesday um, and we've made it not a regular class instruction day. So you're starting off with. 20% less to begin with time to work with kids um, because the purpose of Wednesday is to provide support to students who need additional support, but it's not necessarily new instruction. Under any model, um, and I, I, I think that teach, I know that I'm quite confident that teachers who are on the fall planning committee would, who've discussed this at length, under any model, we are, we are getting a big hit in terms of instructional time, unless it gets minimized if we can pull off the ability to teach students live and in class simultaneously. Um, then, then, because then actually, if we can do that, then teach students would actually be getting class four out of five days, which is 80% of the days the classes meet, as opposed to 75%, um, under our normal school schedule, 
um, and their classes would actually be longer than they are under the normal school schedule. It is still less total time, but that's not really a function of a mini term approach. The mini term approach is just a way to, uh, to, to divide the time a little bit differently in the interests of health and safety and, and building relationships. I see what you're saying and I agree with that. And I think that um, you made that um, really clear. And I think what we all need to be really clear about is going back to school this way, we are taking a hit in instruction. There's no way we're gonna cover the amount of content that we traditionally hold to ourselves to in our high standards. And it, so I see what you're saying and I agree, but I still see that no matter how we slice and dice this in a hybrid model, we're not going to have what we are our usual high standards. That's right. Um, that that is inevitable, and I and I and I think if you I believe if you ask Troy and Jason, they would say the same thing. Um, that you just don't have as much time with students, um, and again, yeah, you just don't have that much time. And there there are definitely trade offs to doing things as safely as we can in lousy circumstances. Thank you. Sure. Um, Hope, you had had your hand raised, but I don't see you anymore. Do you still have a question? I'm all set. Uh, Elizabeth asked the question I had. Thank you. Okay. I thought that might have been the case, but I wanted to double check. Um, anybody else? From the board. Okay. Uh, Kimberly. Hello. Um, I, um, I appreciate your creativity, Jeff, with this and your, your team. Uh, great job thinking out of the box. Um, and I'm just wondering, do you envision, so, um, you know, you were just speaking to that we would take a hit academically with, with this model, um, do you envision that we would take a similar hit if we were to go 100% remote or, I don't know, what are your thoughts on that? Um, you, would, you would definitely still take it, well, it's, in part it depends what you do with the fifth day. Do, do you have a fifth day which is strictly for support? Because if you start off, and I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I think having the fifth day makes perfect sense, particularly as we're trying to get used to, yet again, a new, a new situation. And there's no question that teachers have a lot to learn and that's gonna take a lot of time. So I'm, I'm not saying it's a bad, but the, the reality is once you take 20% out for new instruction, um, then, then there is a hit. We have also, at least the, the high school and middle school at least, I was, um, are also have built in some time for support for students. Um, and that's a, a chunk of time as well out of the schedule. And I think given the, the experience that we had with the all remote learning experience, I think it is a, again an, a, a good use of time, a smart use of time, uh, but it's not a way that we would necessarily structure time if everybody was in school. Um, but I think it would be important to have something like that if we were all remote, Kimberly. Um, so there are some sort of um, things unless, unless, unless you try to just go into remote learning and try to replicate exactly the schedules that you have or close to them uh, that you have in a regular instruction time. And we did try that for the first week of remote instruction and um, just about just about destroyed the students and the teachers, I would say. So we did have to step back. I think the teachers have learned a lot. Um, so, but still there are some certain challenges that come with teaching remotely and learning remotely that are just not the same as being in person in class. And that is a reality. And I think we're all trying to do the best we can. Um, I hope that answers your question, Kimberly. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think, um, you know, we all, we all experienced the spring, um, but, you know, so I think the reality is that we take, unfortunately, 
some type of an academic hit, regardless of the platform we move forward with, you know, it, it, given the pandemic that we're in. I would agree with that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Thank you, Kimberly and Jeff. Um, let's move on, uh, Kathy Stankard. Let's hope, can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. You know, what I was saying when you couldn't hear me was how glad I was that I wasn't going to be that I wasn't gonna be screen sharing given the issues Jeff was having and then my volume goes, but anyway. <laughs> so yes, Kathy Stanker, Director of Teaching and Learning. I wanna address four questions tonight. Um, the first question is how have educators been preparing to teach more effectively in a hybrid or remote learning environment? The second is what resources are we utilizing to support effective instruction in a hybrid or remote learning environment? The third is what professional development have we planned to support effective instruction in a hybrid or remote learning environment? And finally, how will we support our English language learners and students identified as gifted and talented in either a hybrid or a remote learning environment? So the first question then is about teachers, how they are preparing for a return to school. And I think it's worth remembering that teachers went home on March 13th, thinking they were coming back to school on March 16th, uh, business as usual. And so they had almost no time to prepare. Uh, and that is not the situation we, in which we find ourselves now. Um, so one way that they've been preparing is through summer work projects. Um, we approved 47 summer work projects involving 96 teachers. That is 69% of our faculty. Uh, the projects range in duration from three to 15 hours, and all of them are concerned with improving instruction in a remote learning or hybrid learning environment. And that's either, um, I mean, they range, but um, some are concerned with increasing technological expertise. So for example, uh, Google Classroom, Edpuzzle, Flipgrid, et cetera. Um, collaborating on essential knowledge and skills with teachers at the same, at the same grade level and the same course that's been alluded to tonight. Um, finding additional resources that are appropriate for remote learning. Figuring out how to teach remotely um, those hands-on lessons that are normally done in person, like a science lab or an art lesson. Um, or developing new ways of supporting students um, if we're in person, I think the advisory at, um, at the middle school is a good example of that. Um, in addition, teachers have been participating in summer webinars and conferences. These have all been held remotely, obviously. Um, Teachers College offered uh, professional development and phonics units of study. And so a number of our kindergarten, first and second grade teachers participated in those. Uh, there was also a, a workshop entitled Reimagining Education, which actually looked at uh, issues of equity in a, in part looked at issues of equity in a, in a remote learning environment or a hybrid learning environment. We um, have had access to um, a, a, a database of webinars called Simple K-12 um, and a number of our teachers have participated in this. They are literally hundreds of 30 minute webinars um, on technology like, uh, um, you know, how to use iPads, video conferencing, Google Classroom, but also on how you engage the remote learning, the remote learner, um, how you develop a synchronous lesson and asynchronous lesson, et cetera. And then we've also had teachers participating in webinars sponsored by an organization called the Bureau of Education and Research. So for example, a couple of our world languages teachers participated in a day long workshop on distance learning for world language teachers. So. Um, so in addition to summer work projects and the summer webinars and conferences, we also, and this has been already been talked about, so I'll, I'll move quickly through it. We've had teachers, teams of teachers in each school working on identifying the essential knowledge and skills so that we can guarantee a consistent curricular experience that is feasible in a hybrid or remote learning environment. I think we've established the fact that we are not gonna be covering 100% of what we would normally do. So we're identifying that which we believe to be the most essential and that it, and, and it, it will be offered in a, in a consistent way um, with students being held to the same expectations if they're in the same course at the same grade level. 
And those are the learning targets that will guide our assessment and our grading. Um, and there was a question asked about whether um, all levels of required courses and all electives would continue to be offered. I think this was primarily about the high school and Jeff, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but as far as I know, um, that, is, that is the case. It is the case, Kathy. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so the second question is then, what resources are we utilizing to support effective instruction? Um, so as has been said, um, we have agreed uh, as a district um, that we will all be using the same instructional platform, Google Classroom. Um, and that's true, um, that, that is how instruction will be delivered K through 12. Um, this will provide consistency across the grade levels and courses and it will improve ease of use. Uh, we are planning to train students when they return to school in those rollout days. And we're also gonna be offering families training in Google Classroom. Um, and then um, again, as has been mentioned, we have selected Zoom as our video conferencing platform. Um, there were a group of teachers who volunteered to meet last week to discuss the pros and cons of Google Meet, both as it is currently and what we anticipate it will be because there, uh, there is talk of additional features being added and, um, and Zoom. And after reviewing all of the features, um, this committee unanimously recommended that the district adopt Zoom as its video conferencing platform. The district administrative team um, has adopted this recommendation, as you know. So Zoom will be used for all synchronous instruction, um, K-12, um, and, um, and for all meetings. And some of the most compelling features um, were the fact of the waiting room, that you have an unlimited gallery view, superior image and sound quality, the hand raising feature, the ability to put students in breakout rooms and bring them back, um, dual monitor capability, and uh, digital annotation tools. And again, we will be training students um, in, in use of Zoom when they, when they return to school. Um, and then finally, instructional resources. We've already had IXL for students in grades three through 12, um, at, and that will continue, but we're expanding it to include science and social studies and Spanish. Um, at Pond Cove, um, we have the digital platform for everyday math available in mystery science. We're also in the process of securing Teachers Pay Teachers, which is a wonderful resource for teachers, literally thousands of lessons available and also Dreambox Math, which um, I won't go into now because I realize we're running out of time, but I, I, I would like at some point to talk in more detail about some of these additional programs that we're adding. Um, at the middle school, we have a digital platform available for Glencoe Math and STEM Scopes, which is a um, way that we deliver our science curriculum and again, something that can be done entirely online. We're also, as I mentioned, in the process of securing teachers, pay teachers, for those teachers as well, and also Newzella, which is curated and differentiated contact in content in the ELA science and social studies. And then at the high school, we've got Newzella, which I've just mentioned, Ed Puzzle, and then tools for teaching AP courses in a hybrid or remote learning environment. So Google Classroom, Zoom, and then all of the instructional resources I just mentioned. Third question. What professional development have we planned to support effective instruction in a hybrid or remote learning environment? So first of all, the tech integrators in each school have um, this summer um, or will in the first two weeks of school be training teachers in Google Classroom and Zoom um, and then assisting with the implementation of other grade level or course, um, course or school specific digital tools. Um, the nurses will be training teachers in health and safety protocols. The school, as Del mentioned, the school counselors, social workers, psychologists, and our BCBA will be providing professional development on trauma-informed instruction and social emotional learning, as this topic will be an important part of students' return to school. And then finally, other professional development that we've scheduled, this all involves outside coaches and experts taking uh, the PD will be taking place on Zoom and it will be focusing on hybrid or remote uh, teaching in, in a hybrid or remote learning environment. Um, so we're planning to work with the local chapter of Dale Carnegie on engaging students online. We have um, a literacy coach providing PD in the TC phonics units of study as well as on that would be for um, 
teachers of kindergarten, first and second grade. And then um, another coach working with uh, ELA teachers in grades three through eight on discourse. Um, discourse is different in a remote learning environment or a hybrid learning environment. So we will I'm gonna take advantage of her expertise. Um, we have a coach coming in to work with teachers on the digital platform of everyday math. And then another um, trainer coming in to um, work with the middle school science teachers on, on STEM scopes. And then finally, how will we support our English language learners and students identified as gifted and talented? So for English language learners, currently we have a full-time teacher for 19 students. Um, an additional nine students will have to be screened. Um, we've received guidance from the main DOE that this screening can take place in person or remotely. So we will be able to um, fulfill our, our, our legal and moral obligation to those students. Um, we have hired a um, half-time ELL ed tech who will be meeting with small groups of students, primarily at the middle and high school, either in person or online, depending on the model that we adopt, um, primarily to support their learning in content-based courses. Um, and then finally, gifted and talented. So you know that the screening and identification process for rising fourth graders had to be suspended last year. But if we are in a hybrid learning environment, that, that process will go forward in September for those students. Um, if we are in a 100% remote learning environment, then we will, um, we're, we haven't, we're still figuring that out. Um, students who have been identified for GT services in grades five through eight are going to receive them, whether we are in a hybrid learning environment or a remote learning environment, um, in accordance with the schedule that's being that developed at the middle school that you saw presented tonight. So I realize I just raced through a lot of information um, and um, happy to take questions now and, and also in you know, follow up emails or phone calls. Thank you so much, Kathy. Are there any questions from the board? Kimberly. Hello, Kathy. Um, thank you for that very thorough um, update. It sounds like you guys have um, been working hard with lots of uh, great ideas. So thank you so much for that. Um, I had been looking through the Gorham um, plan uh, for returning to school and it looked like they had like a specific remote learning software maybe um, and I wondered if that's anything that we've considered and I I guess that's what I'm wondering. Um, can you give me more details like what what exactly that means a remote learning software are you talking about I, like a, an NLMS a learning management system? It may well be. I'm sorry. I was just trying to to look it up right now. I'm sitting in the library parking lot because I got kicked off Zoom at home, so my resources are not with me. So um, I'll I'll send you an email if I um, can get the exact information. And um, Kathy, I, Kathy, I think I know what it is. It's Edmentum Exact Path. Okay. Is that is that a learning management system? Do you know, Joe? Edmentum we we've used. Uh, and it provides uh, courses for seventh grade and up. I don't know exactly what Edmentum exact path is. Oh, I see. But I believe, because I was looking through that same document that Kim's referring to. Okay. Gorham, and I saw that they did, they have purchased that. And I believe it is for middle school and high school. So almost like a virtual high school type it's program. It's very not. similar to virtual high school. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so I would say no, we have not. Um, I think we have felt that we can meet our students' needs um, without doing that. Um, but I'm certainly open to considering that, um, especially for those students who are going to be 100% remote. Excellent. Thank you. And I'm sorry, I did not have my information here to, <laughs> to hey, you had Dell at the ready. I, thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Um, I have a question. Your uh, first question. Um, 
your first answer to the first question was talking about how much uh, teachers have been learning over the summer mm -hmm. and all the different subjects that they were gaining knowledge on. Is there a plan to share the wealth for teachers now to teach each other about that information? Is that in the plan for the first few weeks of school? Well, so if you had asked me that question under the calendar that you approved the last time we met, I would have said, we'd be hard pressed to find that time because just the all that professional development that i outlined combined with well including the work that the nurses are going to need to do and the mandatory trainings that don alluded to i i don't think there, there wouldn't have been time but with the calendar proposal before you now the idea that we will pick up an extra four days absolutely absolutely and i know you know some of that's already been happening um i you know at the high school at the end of the school year there was a sharing of best practices that was very very effective that's good to hear i think um i, I think that's so essential so agree are there any other questions and maybe heather maybe that's why we're not running out to purchase a remote learning program perhaps we have a lot of talent right here. A lot here. of talent right mm -hmm. here in this district. Yes. Yes. Yes, yes we do. Um, all right. Well, thank you very much for Ka that, Kathy. Um, it was chock full of information, but uh, very much appreciate it. Uh, continuing, we have Max. We were out of order. I believe Max is Perry, our Director of Facilities and Transportation. Good evening. Uh, I'm going to try to go as quick as possible, but uh, you know, feel free to stop me if, if you want to ask questions about something. I know we have about four or five more to get through. Um, I'll start off with uh, answering some of the questions that were posed on the, the paperwork we received and then finish up with some information in reference to the uh, facilities study we received back in September. Uh, one of the questions that I received was on transportation, and Donna, I believe, did answer this question, but uh, transportation schedule will be released when all details of student enrollment are finalized, and we know who would be on uh, Maroon Day and Gold Day and, and who's going to stay full remote and those things. Once that's all cleared up, then we'll get a transportation schedule out to the public uh, if we should go with the hybrid program. Uh, we had a teacher ask about plexiglass in classrooms. As of right now, and I'll say everything that I have been doing in the past few months has been subject to change. Every day it seems like I'm playing a game, uh, you sunk my battleship. Um, so <laughs> what, every, everything that I'm going to talk about now is always subject to change. But anyway, play, plexiglass in classrooms. For right now, um, I am just focused on high traffic areas where we know we're gonna have a lot of people coming and going, such as the main offices and, and possibly guidance offices. And, and we'll go from there. Uh, but we, do we will have face shields available and masks as well uh, to those who need it in, in the meantime. Um, Let's see, hand washing. I, mean, I had a request to see if we would have any portable hand washing stations in classrooms. Uh, as of right now, there is no plan to have portable hand wash stations due to the uh, maintenance of the removal of the wastewater and adding of the fresh water to the tanks in a portable station. Uh, we will be, we're actually in the process right now of installing um, hand sanitizing stations with a safe uh, foam 70% 70, 70 alcohol-based uh, hand sanitizer in each room. And we'll probably even expand outside of each room. There might be some in the hallways, offices. Right now the focus is on the classroom, but that will grow uh, as we have more time to install them. Uh, let's see. I have classrooms. Uh, teaching staff will need to dis disinf uh, no, that's it. A uh, teacher had asked whether who was going to be handling uh, disinfecting of classrooms in between classes. Uh, I know some schools are thinking about keeping kids in the room. Other schools, such as the high school, are going to continue with 
um, the same plan as switching from classroom to classroom. Uh, those teachers would be responsible for disinfecting their classrooms. And that is solely just due to the lack of manpower. We would have nowhere near the custodial uh, capabilities to disinfect each classroom at the change of class. So uh, that would be handled by the teacher and we would supply chemicals to them to uh, do the disinfecting. Uh, there was a question about PPE, and I believe Jen and Donna both answered this one as well. But we do, I do have some supplies that I purchased um, for my department, but also uh, added a little more to the list. So we had something to start up with if we should go with the hybrid. So we do have, I have about 2,000 uh, non-surgical disposable masks, and I'd say about 50 face shields. Um, rubber gloves, all the basics, um, no gowns, no Fordell. <laughs> um, I, our, our plan for the year would be uh, just disinfection of buildings would be the main focus. Uh, should we go with the hybrid and the, the cleaning of the building would come second. Not saying that we would leave our buildings dirty. Um, but the focus would obviously be on disinfection first. And uh, when, once that is completed and we feel good about that, then the cleaning part would begin. Uh, all ventilation units uh, will be operating with the maximum amount of fresh air uh, that we can set the dampers for. Uh, most are at 100% that they can uh, pull in outside air and exhaust internal air as well. Um, Oh, and I also had a question on air purifiers and uh, air purifiers or HEPA filters and fans in classrooms. And this is still a work in progress. And, and I, actually, I actually read an article in the New York Times just before coming into this meeting where they have, I guess, just discovered today that uh, scientists were able to retrieve uh, COVID from an aerosol in, in a hospital, which means that the ruling could very well go past a six foot um, social distancing that it is now airborne. But more to come on that, uh, we'll, we'll see what the CDC and WHO uh, do with that in the, in the upcoming weeks. Uh, I wanna circle back to the facility study that we received back in September 2019. Um, Colby Company had reported in that study that there was a, uh, there were areas of concern in all the buildings of inadequate ventilation. Uh, in the past week, I've been going through the buildings and have discovered that the high school, aside of the, the ground floor where the auditorium and gymnasium is, the second floor of the high school and what I consider the first floor where the main office is, has no ventilation in the hallways whatsoever. There are no vents in the ceiling. It was never installed back in 1969 when the uh, building was built. And also we found the same uh, set of circumstances in the nurse's office at the high school as well. Um, we are looking into the possibility of getting ventilation, stealing some ventilation from the main office and getting it into the nurse's office to relieve that part of the problem. But the, the hallways is a much larger issue and would, call, would uh, require a full scale renovation. Um, the middle school and Pond Cove are a similar setup, not quite as bad. They do have vents in their hallways, but um, not nearly enough, and they're kind of small, smaller sized for the amount of air they need to uh, put out, but they do have somewhat of ventilation there. Um, let me see if I'm forgetting anything. Uh, and, I, and I also have some smaller spaces where more one-on-one -on -one type things happen. I will be sharing those with principals. I already have with Jeff Shedd. Um, I will be working on Troy and Jason's list as well. I just 
had to take a little bit of break from it while hallways were getting waxed before I could get into some of the areas uh, to complete my list. Um, outside of that, it's business as usual. Uh, I'll, I'll try to finish on a good note that we do have a grant for uh, an, LED, an LED project that's happening in the high school and has been happening for the most part all summer. That is winding down to the end and we will have I'll say 95% LED lighting within the high school building. So try to end on a good night. No. Any questions? Yeah, Kimberly, go ahead. Sorry, I think I didn't put it down from my prior question. Okay, uh, Nasser. Hey guys. So I got a couple of questions and uh, I was gonna save this question for the end, but I think it's the right timing. Well, we had a nice feedback from many, many people uh, with via emails. And one of the emails that stood out for me uh, was, was actually one of our staff and, and uh, professional and I suspect their uh, opinion in reference to health issues in the health background and they had, uh, she had um, raised the question about uh, can we utilize the technology, can we utilize the money that we are receiving for technology? And one of the questions will pertain to that, how much are we actually um, going to be utilizing of that uh, state funding towards the equipment, fans, ventilation, spraying, wiping, all that stuff. Do you have any idea, Perry, what that number may be? And I'm glad that you answered that uh, you're giving some responsibility to the teachers. It's unfortunate, but it helps. Uh, that was one of my questions. And are they going to have something easy like uh, Lysol spraying uh, for them? And in reference to the, uh, the, the New York article that you just read, um, could we use window fans? I know it's all, all about cost. In reference to the hallways not having, we can have those industrial ground fans, but they may make noise. But all this adds up, as you said, and the games does change on us uh, quite a bit. And I'm, I love that analogy of the, you sank my battleship. Um, so if you could see how much money might be utilized, it's not as unknown. From now to the school starts for the first three months, you may have a budget. After that, the budget may change again. So uh, that's the question. And then question for Heather and others is the, is the, is the um, email that we read uh, from one of our staff. And could we address that? Could we utilize the state funds towards the technology that could be utilized for us in the long run? And that person's idea was let's stick through everything online learning as opposed to going uh, hybrid. So I'm asking a lot of questions and I'm sorry, but I'm done for tonight, I think. <laughs> All right, that's, I, I'm just gonna shoot off on some of the, uh, some of the ones that were pertaining to me. Um, as far as air purifiers and fans, I, I'm, I'm just finding that they're, they're, I'm seeing cases where they talk about how fans and air movement can manipulate the the uh, the virus within a classroom where uh, let's just say you have a fan in the back window of the classroom and it's blowing out. What what happens is if a if a student in the front opposing corner in of the classroom coughs or sneezes, whatever that gets out, the fan in the back room can cause the germs that they just let out and and now does away with the six foot ruling and can draw it towards the fan infecting everybody in the path. Um, they, they do recommend it, uh, CDC does recommend fans and HEPA filters for your home, but you really have to be cautious in a public environment setting. Um, there were a couple studies done in China where there was a, a restaurant that they believe uh, a large portion of the people in the restaurant were infected by the air conditioning system that you know, just pulls air in and blows it right back out. That's the same type of scenario. So 
I, I'm hesitant with the with the fan thing. Um, that would that would need to be a group discussion, and I think the nurses would all need to be included in that and and decide as a group as to uh, how we want to handle that. Um, we are looking at more technology as far as the uh, ventilation system. Uh, we don't we don't. It, it would it would be an exorbitant amount of work to get ventilation into the hallways um, because of all the existing plumbing pipes, um, sprinkler lines, data cables, electrical lines, everything that's already up in the city would need literally need to be moved out of the way in order to put ventilation in those hallways. So I, I, I think that type of project would exceed the amount that we currently have and go quite a bit past it to do a project like that. Um, I don't know, am I missing, am I missing anything else? <laughs> but yeah, we, I, to, to just back up, you know, like Donna had sent me an, an email today and uh, Aaron Taylor, one of our nurses had sent me an email about um, ozone, it's like an ozone generator that helps to cure, uh, I, I, I'm learning as we go here. It, the COVID SARS V2 or, or however they were, it does kill that virus. And I'm looking into that technology. I was actually waiting to hear, to see if we if they were gonna declare it as an, an airborne aerosol. And it looks like we might be heading in that direction. Um, so that makes me feel a little more confident about that spending money on that type of system versus uh, what it was before was just an, an um, when they when they said airborne, it was more mucus or water droplets from a sneeze or a cough. The the airborne aerosol is more of you're releasing it in speech. Um, so more to come on that, but we are pursuing the option of uh, a better technology within our ductwork. So the question that you left out here is the total budget that you have aligned for this and I personally I think you could alone spend the million dollars uh, easily uh, within the six months so do you do you have what are you spending so far and do you expect to spend more I'm I'm definitely expecting to spend more um, I actually don't know the total of what I spent so far but I <laughs> I'm being a little more cautious because there's so much unknown. I, and, and, and I'm kind of a, you know, I like my gizmos. I pretty much have a room right around me right now full of gizmos that I like. Um, but with, with this, I'm, I'm being a little more cautious with our spending on, on how we proceed with things. Um, and it's simply only because of the unknown. I, for instance, one of, one of the things that sunk my battleship this week, along with other the facility directors throughout the state, was um, a lot of the schools were relying on these uh, electronic, I'll call it a fogger. Um, anyway, it, you, you, put, you put the disinfectant in it and you can literally come into a room or a school bus, which is what we were really focusing on, and actually go and you can disinfect an entire school bus within eight minutes. Um, very handy tool. Well, the EPA rolled in this week and told everybody that you are not allowed to use those in a public environment, that it would require a pesticide applicator's license. Um, for each person who would be using it. Uh, that was a major blow to a lot of schools uh, this week because I know, I, I know specifically there were a bunch of schools that literally bought one per custodian and they're, you know, upwards from 800 to a thousand dollars depending on which you're purchasing. And uh, yeah, they were, they were manning their whole staff with one. And uh, fortunately uh, we have a few, but um, uh, the two that I had coming, I'm able to return. So, or I canceled the order. But yeah, um, I, we're proceeding with caution. I don't know the actual dollar amount. I'm sure Marcy could figure that out probably within 10 minutes. But um, is that we, technology the same as they use in the, on the planes to disinfect planes? I believe that's the, the O2 system that they're using, which is what we will be looking into shortly. 
Okay. Um, Donna had just sent me an email today that Falmouth was pursuing that and the, uh, the college where Aaron Taylor had gone over in New Hampshire uh, is installing that system as well. So I, I'm, I'm pursuing it. I'm, I, like, I like to see third party testing on everything before I, you know, what, what the manufacturer tells me and, and what's actually the case. I, you know, I want to I wanna read it and make sure it's working. Thank you, Perry. Yeah, thank you. Anything else? Elizabeth had a question. Thank you. Perry, I was wondering, um, since typically the there we don't have the kind of custodial staff during the day to go through and sanitize the bathrooms, since we're in an atypical situation, if we are able to open in a hybrid, um, will we have custodians um, sanitizing those high touch areas, especially restrooms? Yes, uh, that is the plan. Um, what I would do if we went with the hybrid route, I'm, I would start off with one custodian on day shift in, in uh, one of the, we have one up at the middle school and elementary and one down at the high school. I would start with that and see what type of workload they can handle and if they start to lag behind, we're, we're currently looking into whether we could take somebody off a night shift and, or actually two people, it'd be an, an additional one for each building um, that could work day shift as well. So we, we would end up with two people in each building and they would handle um, the lunch duty, disinfecting and, and the bathrooms as well. Um, I do want to tackle, the plan is to tackle the the bathrooms more during the day and focus on them on, on a rotational schedule. Um, I, it, there's a lot of unknown at this time until we would actually pull the trigger and, and learn as we go. Um, but yes, there, there would be a, it, overall in general, there is going to be a high focus on disinfecting. Great, thank you. Um, also, kind of nothing new to those of us that have been paying attention since the uh, facility study was done that we have some major issues with ventilation. But my, I kind of have a specific question about the, um, the rooms that were sort of repurposed from like storage closets into instructional rooms. And, and can you talk about those a little bit? Uh, yes, those have all been flagged. <laughs> Um, what, what I'm looking for when I go into a space is not only a vent of fresh air coming in, but a vent to pull air out, um, you know, creating that fresh air and also exhausting the air that's in the room in the, in the space. And a lot of, a lot of storage areas, um, uh, I know I, I saw Christine here. Yeah, Christine's here. Uh, her office is, is a former storage space. Hi, Christine. And, uh, you know, that type of space has just a, an exhaust vent. So it doesn't have fresh air coming in. It's just an exhaust vent. Those spaces are fine for that employee to be in. It's when other people would join them that then it becomes an issue. So what I, what I said, uh, the list I had given to Jeff Shedd was those, those people can work in those spaces, you know, as it, them being their office, but, uh, you know, the recommendation is not to have a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two, three, four in those spaces. It's, it would literally just be their office so that they could work out of and answer phone and check emails and things like that. Uh, we do have a couple classrooms that were uh, um, divided in half. The ventilator um, is naturally mounted on the outside wall. So the, the room that is now on the outside wall has ventilation. The room on the inside hallway part of the space does not. So again, there, those are all situations where that could be uh, used by one person or maybe even for storage, whatever we need it for. But the, rec the recommendation would not be to exceed one person in those spaces. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on, we've got Director of Nutritional Services. 
see. Where's Peter? Are you here, Peter? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, hi. Um, I really didn't have any questions. I just have um, a couple of uh, scenarios that we have, you know, put forth our um, remote. We would continue with our um, sending food home on a, on a regular basis for those that are in need. Uh, also in the hybrid model, um, unfortunately, we're going to need to order um, quite a bit of extra equipment to facilitate the delivering to the classrooms. Um, and also we're in the process of trying to hire some extra substitutes on to try to also expedite the meal service. Um, we also have got a quote and actually I'm going to uh, call the person tomorrow and we have an online meal ordering service that will be um, something that will be part of the our menu planning software that will be an app that uh, students or uh, parents can order up to a month previous and uh, it would complete, completely um, eliminate all of our POS systems in contact with students. Um, they would order their meal, um, they would be charged and then also we would be able to deliver by classroom and or um, however we end up, what model we end up being in. But um, that's what the nutrition department is doing. Okay. Thank you, Peter. You're welcome. Doesn't look like there's any questions. So athletic director, Jeff. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, so before I begin, I'd just like to reiter reiterate uh, a lot of the information uh, in this update is, is, is tentative. Um, things seem to be evolving, what seems to be like on a daily basis. Um, st there's still a number of unanswered questions. Also, um, as Perry had mentioned, just sim some of the simple planning things that we were sort of counting on, like the uh, electrostatic um, handheld sprayer, which would significantly reduce time sanitizing. Um, that that's sort of a game changer, no pun intended, for for how we were going to clean equipment and um, keep things sanitized. So it's evolving, but just uh, wanted to provide some information as to where we are at this point. So um, the Maine Principals Association recently provided schools with a document to begin high school fall sports on September 8th. This was done with the guidance from the CDC, the Maine Department of Education, um, the NFHS, uh, the National Athletic, Direct National Athletic Trainers Association, and a number of school administrators. Uh, the document is a work in, uh, in progress, um, and we're expecting some more updates in the next few days. Um, Currently, schools across the state are in the process of creating a COVID response team. Um, they're tasked with the responsibility of creating and implementing a safe return to play plan. This would align with the district's return to school guidelines as well as the MPA guidelines. So some of the um, key points to the COVID response team would be um, identifying protocols uh, and guidelines and disinfecting standards, but one of the most important pieces to this will be educating students, families, and coaching staff. Um, it will be, if fall sports do happen, it will be a change. It's going to happen at a slower pace than what people may be used to right now. So the education piece is, is going to be, is going to be um, prudent and um, super important. On July 6th, um, high school students in 14 of the 16 main counties began a voluntary summer phase-in program, which was created by the MPA. Um, this was a, a very controlled setting uh, that provided students a, an opportunity to um, participate in a non-sport specific and strength and conditioning activity. The second phase began July 20th, and we're currently in phase three. 
um, and still 14 counties participating out of the 16. Uh, phase four will begin August 24th. Uh, this will be a continuation of the volunteer summer strength and conditioning for fall uh, sports only. So we are preparing for this target date um, to participate. Uh, again, it's voluntary. Um, a lot will depend on where schools are currently and what's happening in each county. Phase, phase five um, is the September 8th fall sports preseason start date uh, for the high school. Uh, while waiting for the information from the Maine Principals Association, our COVID response team will be fine tuning our return to play plan. Um, at this time, we don't have any fall competition schedules. Leagues are creating regionalized schedules based on the latest MPA guidelines, um, which will reduce the number of opponents, re reduce travel, um, and kind of keep um, better, it'll keep our, it'll improve our tracing and um, limit travel. Um, immensely and which probably is a good thing it's been a we traveled by several schools when things were better and um always wondered why we'll drive by five or six schools going to one location so there's a benefit from all this it may be how things are done moving forward um so as soon as we have any of that scheduling information that will be sent out immediately um in addition to a return to play plan, we're also looking at alternative plans in the event that the fall season is not a viable option. So our um, focus is to keep students involved and do that in a controlled and safe environment, um, which would include our coaching staff. Um, so something like that may look like something in house uh, that could be done similar to that phase four model, which would involve more skill work and conditioning. Then at the middle school, there's a Cumberland County Athletic Directors meeting tomorrow to discuss middle school fall sports options. Um, these protocols would be consistent with a high school. Uh, tentatively, the it seems as though schools are leaning towards it the September 21st start date, possibly the 14th, but it's majority have been talking about the September 21st as start date for middle school sports. Um, a concern shared amongst uh, several schools, athletic directors sort of falls in line with Troy's concern and that involves keeping the cohorts if we're in a hybrid model, so group, Group, the, the groups would align with specific days that they're in school. So if a group was learning remotely, that group would not be participating. The group that was in school would participate on that certain day. Um, also looking at competitions, possibly with neighboring schools, even looking at Saturdays, um, this would assist with some transportation logistics um, and alternative planning also includes in-house athletic experience similar to the high school where skill development and um, conditioning type activities would be a potential option even intramurals would be there um, but there's still a lot of work um, that needs to take place in a very short amount of time. Um, and unfortunately, this is a result of where we are. Um, so we're just going to hopefully have something in the next couple of days that is a little more definitive to help start um, or fine tune some of the plans that we've already made. But it's, it's, it's been a challenge not knowing or receiving information um, and going back and having to redo a lot of the work that was spent um, this summer. So, but I'm, I'm feeling pretty positive, pretty good right now, very optimistic and um, 
just appreciate everyone's patience while we uh, sort through this and we will get through it as soon as possible. And uh, that's where we are with athletics. Okay, thank you. Your questions? Kimberly. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the update. Um, this, I don't know if this is a question for you or Donna, um, but if we end up in a situation where we are remote learning, um, whether that be because uh, we've, um, you know, the state has uh, put us in a red zone or the board has decided uh, remote learning is what they're recommending. Um, would we proceed with athletics or would athletics uh, not take place if we are in a remote learning situation? I guess it really depends on the, the circumstances. I mean, I think it could be, it certainly could be an option. Um, I think it, the, you know, especially with being outdoors, things are, with a space, um, having controlled environments and in pods of 10, which has been going on throughout the summer, that might, that it makes things certainly a lot more manageable, but um, it's probably ultimately up to the district and the school board to make that final call. But I think it, it I think it could be manageable if, depending on how extreme things were at the time. Well, we would have to have some long dis discussions about that. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay, Elizabeth. Thank you. Um, so do our sports teams have to follow the CDC guidelines, including six foot distancing and how does that apply to contact sports? That is all in the guidelines. Um, and for a while, again, here's a, a perfect example of things changing. Face masks were to be required at all times. Um, that's changed a little bit now when exercising. That isn't, that isn't the guide, that isn't the um, expectation that they could be removed when exercising. Six foot distance. <laughs> I'm not sure how that happens, but it's, uh, um, it's certainly in that it's going to be uh, permitted in the guidelines, according to the guidelines. And uh, yeah, I, I would, I'm not, honestly, that's, that's, a, that's a good question. And um, I'm sure it has been raised, but. I did hear something that they were looking at possibly doing non um, touching sports. I don't know what you call them, but. Um, sports in which like cross country, um, those types of sports where uh, it wasn't necessary to physically touch another person. Correct. Yeah, there, there's been a lot of stuff that's been through and it's, uh, there's been a lot of, there's a lot of rumor, there's a lot of speculation, a lot of unknown and it makes it even more challenging, yeah. especially for answers um, like, or for questions that you have. That was. That's a great, that's a great question. And I think a lot of us have that same, um, we're just all, we're all kind of in that same boat. No, I agree. And I think that you know that I'm an athletics lover and a supporter, but um, understanding that, you know, and I understand why students, student athletes would not necessarily be wearing masks while they're exerting themselves, but then to say that they wouldn't be distancing strictly six feet apart it's like saying you can't get COVID if you're playing a sport and that's concerning it also opens us up to liability so yeah and and that's actually in the phase five so the September 8th is the phase five and phase five we have not received um official guidelines at this point our our guidelines um that we have run through September 7th.
I had another question, but I don't know if it's really for Jeff or Donna or Perry or Janet. Um, it's really about opening up our facilities and grounds to non-school groups. If we do wind up choosing to have sports and our sports teams are using our school grounds. Um, I know back in the spring, we, you know, we decided that we weren't going to have people in, you know, we're not, I assume we're not going to be renting out our buildings and letting no. people have birthday parties and no. No. that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm, and the, I'm wondering if non-school groups will also be, um, will be allowed to use our fields, whether, whether, you know, separate from whether or not our school teams are using them. Um, well, they're town, it's a town facility. So I think that would require conversation in, with the school and town manager. Okay, any more questions around athletics? Uh, moving on, we've got technology. Good evening. Um, I just have one question that was raised for me. Uh, and the question was, if uh, teachers have outside classes and they wanna do outside classes, would there be Wi-Fi available? The answer to that as of this moment is no. However, we have run three wires, uh, two to the um, uh, Ally Arts uh, wing that will uh, project out to the basketball court and out to the baseball field at the middle school. So there's a possibility to do that. I would have to coordinate with Perry of facilities to make sure he puts a whole two holes in, in his beautiful building um, to put a wire through. Um, we do have the equipment to do that. Also on the 1930s building in the middle school, we have a wire that's already in place there. So that Wi-Fi can be checked, projected between Pond Cove and the middle school. Um, again, I would have to ask uh, Perry to put another beautiful hole in his, his building there. As far as the high school, the answer to that is probably at this moment, no, we have no wires uh, or any plans to do that. And it all depends on where um, those classes would be set up of how easy that would be or how difficult they would be. Um, I don't know if anybody has been going out to the Walmarts, the Best Buys, or, or trying to get things online through Amazon. Um, but technology equipment now is, is very, very hard to get in some cases. Um, we do have the technology equipment to go ahead and do the Wi-Fi for the outside for the, those three wires that I mentioned at the middle school in that Pond Cove. However, um, we do not have in place the Wi-Fi um, equipment out at the high school. So it'll be a combination of where they're going to, um, would like to hold the classes at the high school and then also if we have the ability to actually get the equipment in from the various vendors. And that was my question and I can open it up for any other questions you have. Phil. Yeah, thanks Noel. Um, this is, uh, my first question is I think probably a combination for you and Kathy. You answered this last time, but I've received a couple comments about it again, and that's just the idea of live streaming teaching. You, you did answer that last time, but for some people who are not who weren't on that, I've had some parents ask me, why can't we do that as part of remote learning? And what I remember, it was a it was an equipment issue and technology issue, I believe, and, and perhaps a curriculum issue. But if you could address that, and then I'll just make a quick comment on what you just said about um, uh, Internet, I think uh, we should do whatever it takes to make Wi-Fi available because I'm a strong proponent of the outdoor classroom um, if teachers want to do that. But I think it's a good opportunity. So if we can make that easier, there's a couple couple places where you, we could do it today. I would, you know, it's my my suggestion to do it. That's where I come from on that one. But my question is about the live streaming of, of teaching. Why, why um, live streaming shouldn't be an issue whatsoever. Again, we've never done any of this before, Phil. Um, however, I don't believe there's going to be a problem. I'd like to, you know, reserve a little bit of that comment. Um, and not say we're never going to have a problem. 
um, because the bandwidth is there. Even if we had, even if we had like 90% of the students and still had to do 10% um, outside um, connectivity, I, I, I can't see a problem with that. Um, we have never reached our thresholds doing that. Um, and I just can't see a problem. As far as the equipment, however, Phil, um, right. for example, it, it, whether you talk about um, swivel or owl, or even if you talk about just getting cameras, okay? For example, owl, you know, I contacted the, um, and I don't know if anybody knows what owl is or swivel is, but they're video conferencing um, equipment that are used basically for education. And um, what they do is they follow the, uh, within a, a eight, uh, they say 15 feet, but between a, realistically between an eight and 12 foot feet radi radius, um, a person who's talking, the owl or the swivel, just turns to that person as they're talking. Okay, so it's not really live or anything, but it really does allow it, instead of like this Zoom where everybody just sees one picture ahead, has the capability of, of seeing, a, you know, a student asking a question to the teacher. Well, I talked to the Apple, um, not the Apple, I've talked to the Apple representative today too, but uh, the owl representative today, and they're around 12 weeks out. So if I ordered one tomorrow or ordered 50 tomorrow, it's still 12 weeks out before we get that unit. The same goes with the swivel and also same goes with like Logitech uh, video cameras. If I went to Amazon, there are 18, well, as of one o'clock this afternoon, there was 18 available. Um, and if I went to Logitech themselves, um, and that's just one example, of course, there's a lot um, of video cameras out there, but as of my own experience at home trying to get a video camera, um, uh, it took quite a while, um, about six weeks just to get a sing single one out of, out of China. So those are concerns. We also have concerns um, with some of the equipment, um, you know, the simple things like bags for, for, for you know, that are really non-technical that are used for technology, um, bags for, for laptops and so on and so forth. So, but I also agree with you, Phil, um, those, at least those three, if the, if the calendar is approved um, tonight, um, that would give us a lot more time to do that. Um, and those three would be very easy to do. And again, with the high school, it's really talking to Jeff and Jeff and, and Perry and saying, okay, you know, where, where are the spots that we could do the outside classrooms? Okay, and then taking a look and say, can we, you know, simply put it into our network cabinet or do we have to run some fiber or so on and so forth? So it's just those type of decisions. Great, thanks, that's very helpful. And then Kimberly has a question. She does, go ahead, Kimberly. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank that's, your you. job. that's your job, not mine. Sorry. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. You pretty much answered it. I was just asking or thinking about um, bandwidth. I, I, I've heard it come up periodically and um, wonder, it, it sounds like you feel like, you know, we're in a good place with that, but is it something that can be increased if necessary? And what are the cost implications if that's something we feel we need to do to make things work? Well, the only thing that I would really do, well, first of all, everyone has to understand that we get a very good um, uh, connection um, bandwidth from um, the University of Maine through Network Maine. Um, they use part of, our, uh, part of the uh, E-rate funding to, to supplement that. And they have been very, very good since they've started this. And we've had very little issues with connectivity. Um, the only thing that I would recommend, but then again, this cost is that what happens if network main goes down, okay? And you always want to have, no matter what it is in technology, you always want to have a backup system or some way, and we really don't have to do that. But if network main goes down, the chances are, you know, the other provider, which I'm going to call them Fairpoint, and I know they're not Fairpoint, um, but I'm, <laughs> that's what I'm, what's on my mind that nine at 10 o'clock at night um, would be, you know, also the chance of them going down at the same time would be probably the same thing. So um, again, Kimberly, I, I don't believe we have issues. We'll have an issue with our bandwidth currently. It's just that we don't have something uh, if they decide to go down. Thank you. You're welcome. 
Okay. Um, and then our nurses. Hi, Heather. It's Erin. I'm going to be um, representing the nurses for just a quick presentation and then Karen and Jill are both on the Zoom to be available for questions. Um, but I would like to be able to share my screen. Okay. Um, Jen, can you help her with that? She's on. Okay. So yeah, um, what, what the nurses want to do is just really walk everyone through what a typical day would look like um, from when students and families are home until they, and once they enter the school, as far as precautions we will be taking in the school setting. And then um, as far as if there are, are reported illnesses and what that would look like um, for families as well as for nurse communication. So what you see on the screen right now is the checklist of the symptoms that we will be monitoring for or asking parents to be monitoring for before they send their child to school each day. Um, and if you previous school board meetings and in um, the district planning meetings, if people watch those, there was lots of talk back and forth about what would the screening process look like? Would we be doing it as students were entering the school? Would we be doing it or would we have a database for parents to be reporting to us? And for right now, and as the DOE framework um, has alluded to, it's a home screening that um, will be happening. And it's, it's looking for parents' obligation to commit to doing this every morning before sending their children to school. Um, and so what our plan is at, at this point in time would be to send weekly reminders via power school alert blasts to um, families as a reminder, don't forget to do your symptom checks before you come to school. Um, I'm just gonna scroll down. So as part of this um, screening process, we also have a parent contract. This will be uploaded to the PowerSchool portal as part of the forms that parents fill out prior to their school, their child starting school. Um, similar to the concussion policy forms, um, technology forms and whatnot. And um, so you'll see the first bullet is saying that you've read and understood the parent handbook. We are in the final stages of working through the parent handbook just to make sure that we can have all the added links for um, a lot of what you heard this evening from the administrators. There's spots within this handbook so that um, we have links to the remote learning plans and the um, hybrid plans and whatnot. So once all of that is finalized, then those will be linked in and then we will be able to share out the handbook um, with families. Um, and so we're asking families to read through the handbook, have a good understanding of all of the um, protocols that we're going to have in place, a lot of what you've heard discussed tonight. Um, and, but just to highlight really that this is a whole partnership that we're trying our best to make sure that the schools are as safe as possible. We're following the recommendations of the CDC. We're working on the DOE framework, but it's a full partnership and compliance from the community as well as um, from the staff that's going to be in the school buildings. Um, and I've highlighted um, just the importance really of we, we're we looking for that daily checklist and um, for parents to really be mindful if they're questioning, is my child okay to stay home? If you're questioning it, then keep your child home that day. And when you're reporting your absences to us, it's imperative that if your child is out sick, you tell the school why. Because we're gonna be really working hard to monitor symptoms to see if, about potential um, outbreaks and problems within the community. Um, so depending on what your school does as far as um, absentee reporting, it could be through power school portal, it could be through phone calls. If you're talking to one of the administrative assistants in the building, please let them know exactly why um, your child will be out sick that day. It could be that they're going to a doctor's appointment, but whatever information you can share with us will be very helpful. Um, so next I have two, Hold on, I gotta shrink this. Um, these are a few flow, shot, uh, flow charts. Oh shoot, hold on. 
I'm having a hard time seeing. Let me see. There we go. Oh, okay. This is a flow chart that was, um, it's part of the Department of Education framework. It was, um, it's a collaboration of the Maine Association of School Nurses and um, other, um, other people who have helped really a lot of insight into um, what, what will happen if we have a child who appears sick within the school building. Um, and so it's a, it's a basic algorithm that we would follow. Um, if a child were to show up in our office, we're going to assess them what symptoms are they showing if they are showing that they're coughing complaining of a sore throat if um they're complaining that they might feel feverish we're going to have two offices set up so before that child makes their way into our office um or we're really looking for teachers to be corresponding with us to let them know i'm sending the student down this is their complaint so we're ready for them sometimes it might be that we go to the student in their classroom. Um, but depending on the situation, if it's sounding like a, it could be symptomatic for COVID, we have a special um, isolation room where we put those students versus other students who would need more well child or well office visits, um, such as if they were coming in for diabetes care, medications, should they be hurt on the playground, etc. cetera. Um, so if we were to sus suspect that there were some COVID-like symptoms, depending on the, the type of mask that student is wearing, if it was a face covering, a homemade face covering, we're gonna, end up, we're gonna switch that out, put a surgical mask on them, a little bit better protection, call the, the parents to take the student home, recommend that they reach out to their um, child's pediatrician. This is a sample of what, um, this is from the Maine Academy of um, Pediatrics, and this is, a basic flowchart algorithm of what it's going to look like if you call your pediatrician. So you're going to reach out to them and explain, these are the symptoms my child's having. If it's one symptom, they might tell you, let's watch that, those symptoms for 24 hours. Your child is going to stay home from school. If the symptoms have resolved, the child could come back to school. If there's two or more symptoms, depending on if the symptoms are in the high risk category, then the pediatrician is going to make um, the call of do we continue to monitor? Do I want your child to come in for a COVID test? At that point, um, if the child is does have a COVID test done, then we're gonna wait until, um, if you look at the middle one, the, um, oh, I'm sorry. So if we, do a, if we do the swab, it comes back positive. The child stays home for 10 days, plus they have to be 24 hours fever-free with no medications on board, no Tylenol or ibuprofen, and um, they need to have symptoms resolved um, before they can come back to us. Um, so this is something similar that all, that all pediatricians will be using. Um, for this, this is our, um, this is a copy of the school decision tree. This is from the CDC website. And so this is what would happen if we have a confirmed case of COVID in the building. And so we assess the risk. And so within, um, it could be a short two to five day um, shutdown of the building to allow for um, cleaning, disinfecting and contact tracing. That's the most important um, piece of this, piece, uh, this picture. And so what contact tracing is doing is, um, the nurses would be working very closely with a CDC liaison, um, and that liaison is really going to guide these decisions for us. Um, and so with the contact tracing, we're going to be looking for exposure. And so what exposure means, what is defined as if there is close contact, less than six feet, for a period of time that's equal to or greater than 15 minutes, and this can be cumulative over time, with the person who has tested positive, then certain decisions are going to be made about if that person quarantines or not. As part of the plan that we have in place at our school currently, um, with the measures that we have in place, including social distancing, trying to maintain our students with, within that six foot parameter, um, keeping our students co in small cohorts, requiring the use of uh, facial coverings for everyone who's entering that building and providing opportunities for frequent hand washing in the buildings. If 
when we talk to the CDC, all of those measures are taking place. That's going to reduce the amount of time that we would have to shut down our buildings and um, the amount of time that we would have to have people quarantining. Um, so it's, it's so important that we continue to follow the CDC guidelines. Um, Karen had a great uh, way of describing it is that when you enter the school building, it, we enter thinking everybody could be a potential carrier. Lots of people are asymptomatic carriers. So we wanna make sure we have that, that bubble around us so as to not, um, to not come too close in the, so that we would uh, reduce our exposure risks. Um, another important piece to, to this piece is that if we are in the hybrid model, and so we have two days of in-school and then there's two days of the remote school, the people who are on their remote days and who are looking to cohort with other families, it is so important that you also follow the guidelines in which we are doing in the schools with the social distancing, the masking, because a lot of, if we're not, diligent on the days that we're not in the buildings, so that's when we're going to see um, possible transmission and exposure within the schools. I'm going to stop my share and then open it up for questions. Um, Aaron, I'm going to just chime in too that uh, just how rapidly these resources are changing you know that the pediat the pediatric document just came out on Friday and they're working um, diligently to have resources for the local um, health care providers just to to best meet the needs of the schools I mean they're all kind of figuring this out as they go and they've all been incredibly busy as well so, um, you know, this is all subject to change. It's all a work in progress. And our jobs is to keep abreast of what the guidelines are and to make sure we keep our schools as healthy as possible. I just want to speak, um, Jill Young here, the nurse at the middle school. I just want to speak to some of the questions that we received. And Karen and Aaron, I just received these um, via email. So um, just answering some of these questions, I just scanned through them, but it seems like our community has a lot of questions regarding masks. So um, we will have a protocol and we do have a protocol within our handbooks that once we receive the decision tonight from the board as to how we move forward, um, they will hopefully get from draft form to your hands very quickly, but masks are a requirement. So if you have a child at home that you're concerned about not being able to wear a mask, um, then you should elect a remote option. Masks are a requirement, not an option. 100% um, of the time, with the exception of eating and designated mask breaks. Those mask breaks, uh, six foot spacing, uh, seated ideally, so we can guarantee that the six foot, we can ensure that six foot spacing. So when we cannot ensure that, the masks stay on. Um, and those would be brief breaks, but it is going to be a challenge. Uh, just walking out into the heat and humidity today for a very, very short time. It's hard to keep that mask on and we understand that, but it's what we have to do. If we have any hope of re-entering the building and providing a safe environment, it's the number one defense. So we have to do that. Um, the masks have to be on. So um, heat, humidity, we think about our classrooms this time of year, it's hot and we don't have fans blowing in or maybe not blowing out. So it's not a pleasant environment. Um, there were other questions about clear masks. Uh, we, are, we do have a shipment of those coming in, hopefully. I don't know when we, or if we will get those. That's another decision that needs to be made. We need to have appropriate PPE. That's one of the items along with several others. But um, clear masks would be utilized primarily for those um, hard of hearing, for the staff that it's instructing those that are hard of hearing. Um, and for staff members that are hard of hearing for their students. That would be the primary use as well as those that need it um, for uh, perhaps special ed, foreign language, uh, we would determine who would need those. But we do have those on order through the state. Still waiting for those to arrive as far as I know. Um, sustainability was a question. How can we ensure that our students are going to wear these masks? And 
It's, I said this at the last board meeting, we rely on each and every one of our community members, our staff, our students, our families. It's not just what happens in our building, it's what happens outside of our building. And there is no way for us to track what happens outside of our building. But we all have to, like Aaron said, we have to be diligent that it just takes one mistake, one gap, one error, one person to not, you know, follow these guidelines. And you know we all suffer so sustainability we will make sure that our students and staff follow the guidelines to wear the masks and if we have any difficulty that would be up to admin to enforce but i would think that they would go into the remote option soiled masks and who provides the masks so um, masks it would be the um, expectation that students and staff provide their own masks however the school will also provide up to two masks per staff and student they will be available in the classroom as well as throughout the building for those that need a mask should it become soiled should they forget their mask we will have those available at school as well um, clear face shields they are not ideal so it is in our handbooks that we will provide for both staff and students face shields alone prove to not be enough um, in fact, for those working in close proximity, nurses, special ed, people that can't guarantee and ensure that six foot spacing, face shields are now going to be in addition to our uh, medical um, grade masks. So eye, cover, um, eye protection as well as covering our mouth and our nose is now the recommendation. So face shields are not enough alone. Should there be a situation where a staff member or a student needs a face shield, that would need to be approved by administration, and that is in the handbook. Um, compliance, I've already touched on that. Um, there's questions, and Aaron's already touched on this too, but about the screenings. We've gone back and forth and round and round on this, and I was really, really pushing for and advocating for screenings to be done at school upon arrival to ensure that everybody entering the building is screened. Um, that's how we had had it planned back in June. It changed with the guidance provided in July from the end of July from the main DOE and CDC. Um, and the reason that that guidance changed is because of the asymptomatic. You don't, and because of um, the honesty that's involved in those screening questions. So number one, we are requiring, you know, we're asking for you to be honest. Have you traveled? Have, are you symptomatic? Have you been exposed? And then do you have fever? And have you taken fever reducing medication? So that's all you know, questions that based on an honor system to begin with. And then the, fee the temp check, that's not a catch all. Would it catch a few? That was my hope and that's why I was really pushing for it. What if we catch, if we just catch one, you know, that makes a big difference that could affect many. However, um, I finally came to peace with this decision yesterday that, um, the reason that they're not recommending it is because it doesn't catch everybody. And like Aaron said, we need to assume that everybody in our building has COVID-19. So the person sitting six feet from me, I need to assume that they have the virus. And that is why we are taking all of these precautions. That is why we're wearing the masks. That is why we're doing the distancing. That's why we're washing our hands. That's why we have worked all summer to try to figure this out. So um, we that gave me a little peace of mind that that honor system not only is an honor system, but it won't catch the asymptomatic either. So um, that's why these precautions are in place. Uh, do I feel good about an honor system? And it is, is it a best practice? Absolutely not. Um, but it's the world we're living in. It's a logistical financial nightmare and it's not foolproof. It's not perfect. So um, the screening, hopefully that answered your questions there. Uh, and I think I made it through most of the questions, I hope, so I scanned them quickly and tried to summarize. Any other questions? Thank you, Jill and Erin. I don't see um, any board members raising their hands for questions. Um, are there any other questions in general? Kimberly. Uh, thank you. The three of you I know have worked so hard this summer. So thank you. Thank you for all the hours and thoughts and reading and research. Um, 
And my question is, you know, maybe the um, building principals have thoughts on this, but I'm wondering if there's any intention to have a time um, set aside, like a sort of an information orientation education opportunity um, for each building specifically um, to, you know, sort of go over the compliance and um, orient uh, families to, you know, if we end up in a hybrid situation um, to what the, the new school experience is going to be um, and, um, you know, field questions that people might have specific to their own individual buildings. I mean, I, I think I'll speak for the high school. I mean, I think in general, yes. Is there anything scheduled yet? No. Um, but I think there's a variety of means that need to be used to communicate um, to folks um, and, and let them ask questions and get their questions answered. So I'm sure we'll all do that. I don't have any doubt about that. It's, I, don't, I don't think we have specific plans in place yet, um, but it becomes a priority after whatever decision is made in this meeting to see what we need to communicate. Thank you. Troy, I don't know if you want to speak for the middle school or if you want me to, but um, I can start anyway. Um, for the middle school, we have a plan to provide not only the parent student handbook, but uh, and we have a staff handbook as well, but also a very simplified version for our students. Um, and within that would be a video tutorial of what a day looks like. Um, and that would go over all of our protocols, our expectations, take them through the buses, through the halls with a drone, into a classroom that's set up um, to really give them that visual and also at the same time provide them the education um, that they need prior to day one. Um, we met, as Troy said, last week and did a walkthrough of the halls. We're waiting on some things. Um, our protocols on paper look great, but it's a puzzle and all the pieces need to come together before we can act on it and expedite it. So we need, you know, the signage and we need the PPE and we need the um, sanitizing equip, you know, materials and equipment to come in before we can act on it. Once we have all of that, we will get that film in there. And I think that's going to be the easiest way, just a visual for everyone, both staff, students, not both staff, students, parents, everybody involved to see what our day looks like and what we're doing to make sure everybody feels safe. Elizabeth, you have your hand raised. If people have questions specific to the nurses, I'm happy to wait because I was sort of holding some questions till the end to circle back to some other people that came to me after they spoke and we moved on. I'm not seeing any hands raised, any other hands. So go ahead, Elizabeth. Thank you for that. So um, no matter what we decide tonight, um, our students are gonna be in remote learning at least part of the time. Some of them are gonna be in remote learning all the time and it's likely that they'll all be in remote learning for a period of time. Um, I guess I'd like to know a little bit more specifically at the high school what students who choose 100% remote learning for the semester, you know, what their, what their day will be like. And I'd like to hear about um, the teachers who are going to be teaching from home because of their health situation, um, how they will be delivering their instruction. Um, I have more, I'm gonna just stop there. So, in terms of the teachers who will be delivering instruction, they'll clearly be doing it over Zoom, um, just as if they were in the regular classroom. The only difference would be we'll have to have an adult in the classroom uh, to monitor the half of the students who are participating in the hybrid model and are not 100% remote learning. In terms of the students who are 100% at home, um, Again, I, I, there's some unknowns there. My ideal is they will be able to connect live at the same time as the classes are meeting in the building and they will be able to be sort of participating members of those classes. Um, and, it, and I think 
I, I take some, some comfort from Noel that the, the bandwidth will not be an issue, but I know even he knows that we don't know that for sure until we try it. But there are also just some instructional challenges and some training challenges to be able to make that work. If for whatever reason we can't do that, um, then we'd probably be more like what the other two schools are doing, which is more asynchronous provision of asynchronous work for students to do at home, um, films of lesson, um, teachers, teachers posting videos of them instructing, plus supplemented as they will be at the other two schools by teachers contacting students who are 100% remote at home to, to have regular contact with them during the week. Um, so one way or another, we're going to include the remote learners as, as much as we can and mimic, can, can get close to mimicking the experiences if they were in, in they were part of this, the group that was in, in school for part of the time and home the rest of the time. I'm optimistic we can do that, but if you hear me hedging my bets, it's because we haven't tried it yet. And, and realistically, you can't try it completely until everybody is back um, and we can actually do it. Thank you. Um, I guess this is probably for Donna. Um, I think there probably has to be sort of a go, no go date as far as PPE or other things that need to be in place as far as if we do choose to go with a hybrid model, knowing that we don't have the necessary PPE in or, you know, there are other things that aren't in place yet when would there's still time. But if, you know, time runs out, you know, there, I think that there needs to be a date and we need to set it tonight or set it together that says some, you know, maybe it's one week before school is due to open. If we don't have everything in place, we notify people that we can't go hybrid yep. or whatever it is. I feel like we need to have a hard date. Yeah, I, I think a week before is, is uh, realistic. I'll yield to later. Sorry, I muted myself. Any other questions? All right. Uh, may I have a motion for item 4A? Oh, sorry. No, we switched it around. My apologies. Me, um... Oh, sorry, sorry. I don't have it in front of me. Um, somehow it didn't print properly. My apologies. May I have a motion? I move we approve the plan for reopening the schools in the fall as discussed. A second what back. plan would that be? <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, sorry. I thought it was the plan that the administrators uh, recommended, which was the AB, uh, AB with Wednesday. So are you talking um, about the hybrid model, Laura? Oh, yes, the hybrid model. Oh. Sorry. Yes, the term hybrid model. That was also my assumption um, that that was being presented to us tonight. So I'd second that, mo that motion. Okay, I'm back on, I've got it. Um, discussion, board members. Hope. Okay, I'm just gonna, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, okay, thank you. Just gonna jump in because I'm afraid that I will not be able to speak in a few minutes. But, um, uh, so um, we're deciding whether or not we're gonna move forward with proceeding with the hybrid model, which is yellow. Um, I'm just gonna throw some thoughts out here because we're having a discussion now. And so this is, this is our period for discussion. Um, I think the plan is excellent, and I think the work that was put into the plan was impeccable. I think um, you can't ask for better planning 
Um, I think every detail was, you know, covered and there's no stone left unturned. I think um, it is equitable to the 100% remote, um, the opt-out people. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm saddened that we've basically diminished lesson time for everyone. And that seems to be, that's just the nature of the beast right now. Um, uh, you know, um, but I think um, sort of, you know, the, the best laid schemes of mice and men, you know, we know what happens. I think there's a, a fair number of issues in it, with with proceeding with the hybrid plan that I still have a great deal of of concern over. So the first being compliance. So we're we're sort of the the hybrid plan relies on faith, um, good you know faith faith in that certain things will happen, so that we'll have a, a, a an appropriate level of compliance. Um, as we all know, this is this is hard, and it's been hard um, to get, get kids to do the right thing. Someone mentioned outside of school, we have to be compliant. Um, to the extent we have sports, I mean, we're sort of waving our hands and saying that that's, you know, um, that those individuals who are participating in sports who might be coming into the classroom for the hybrid model um, aren't actually increasing the risk greatly. So I think, I mean, an analogy for the sports participation is we're putting screens on the windows, but we left the front door open. So I, I think to the extent we were to go with a hybrid model, um, we really need to have parents or families who have students participating in close contact sports, if that should happen, really be encouraged to opt out because I think that's, that's a huge hole. Um, the facilities. Uh, what can I say? I mean, we know, we all know the issues there. I heard, I just heard really concerning issues about facilities and the ability to go in to many areas of the schools with no ventilation or poor ventilation. Uh, I hear, you know, my children reporting in the winter time that sometimes the windows have to be left open because it gets so swelteringly hot and there's just, I have a lot of concern about that. Um, um, so, and then I, you know, so I'm, I'm trying to weigh the, we're all trying to weigh the costs and benefits of what we're doing here. And I know that the, the harm of having students out of school is, is great and real and, and actual. So it's been, we've incurred that harm and we're continuing to incur it. Um, but my concern is what we're doing with the hybrid plan is we're giving students two days a week and that, and, and that doesn't really you know that are, we're, we're taking we're giving two days a week in exchange for what in exchange for taking on the the, the question mark of what's going to happen when kids go back to school this fall so um i know janet mills said we're green and i know that that is very important and i, I think we all you know we're we're maine's in a great place um we did the right thing by closing early and i think cumberland county did you know the leadership we showed and the district's closing early is what helped us get where we are um, but Cape Elizabeth was the first school district with a student. Uh, we're, the hot, we're, we're one of the top five cases for the state. We have a higher rate. Um, effectively, I think if you look at the statistics of our rate as a town, we're akin to my, my, um, Michigan or Ohio in our rate. Um, at any rate, all that being said, I don't want to... Um, I'm very, I'm very, I'm absolutely torn on this, and I don't want to say no, no in classroom instructions because I know that there's a great need, and there are students who need to be, who need this, and it's like I said, the harm is great and the harm is real, um, but I don't know that the two days in school is the benefit of that outweighs the risk. So. Um, I do wonder why are we rushing into this? I think John Volz had a good point. Um, why are we the first district? If we were the first district with a case, can we be, you know, uh, are we open to letting other districts open and seeing what happens? Giving, the, we, you know, we, we still don't know if we're gonna have the equipment by this start of school. So why don't we say to parents, this is what the first four weeks of school will look like and decide now it's going to be red. And then we'll, and then we, and then we go from there as opposed to if we say we don't, if we don't have the PPE and we won't know until the week before school, we're all just sitting in limbo. 
until the end of August. So we could make a decision to say, it's just gonna be red because we're not ready. I mean, I'm not saying we're not ready, but so those are my thoughts. Like I said, I'm torn as I'm sure everyone else is and I'd love to hear what everyone else has to say. Bill, go ahead. I guess I'll go next. That was, um, you know, I, sh I shared a lot of those concerns. I'm landing in a different place. So I've thought a lot about a lot of the, the things that Hope just said and, and uh, struggled with that uh, since our meeting two weeks ago. Um, where I'm coming down is I think it's extremely important for certain kids, particularly young kids, to, to have some classroom time. I think. It, uh, it was not successful in my view for a lot of young kids. It's very difficult for kindergarten, first, second, third ki grade kids to do this on their own. It's very difficult for parents uh, to be able to teach them full time. We're not, we don't have a plan in front of us that, that had um, older kids stay home and younger kids uh, come back, but I would have been comfortable with that. Uh, and I'm not trying to change it this late in the, the game, but I've always thought it was it was more difficult for for the children of younger ages to uh, to to be out and and I think it hits families at a more disparate level. You know, some families we were one of them, uh, quite frankly, that could could have some come in and help. And we know a lot of parents who could not. And I think that that suffers. It's it's a really full time job to work with kids at home when we're, when we're talking about K through four or even or even a little bit older. Um, I think we work really hard as a state to get to where we are. Um, as of yesterday, you know, Dr. Shaw said we had a 0.74% positivity rate. I had one parent, I reached out to everyone I know in this community, asked them what they thought, and that was one comment that sort of stuck with me, which he said, if this isn't what we were working for, then what is? Um, it's still a very much a risk, and I hear the nurses have said, and I, I think we need to be ready to close, quite frankly, um, if things change um, the next day. So it's not to push through and be stubborn about it, but but from what I'm hearing from the CDC, from the Department of Education, from our neighboring communities, um, and from our governor that, that, that we're okay to open um, with uh, guidelines, I think it's extremely important for educational purposes for a lot of our kids to have some of that face time. It doesn't work as well for some as others. And I think we leave a lot of kids behind if we just say five days a week at home. Um, it, really, it really makes me nervous, quite frankly, um, to go into that model. So I, I, I sort of look at the uh, as the outlier. I don't see it as let's let the other districts, which I think would be all of them at this point, are going back in some way, uh, be the guinea pig. I think we would be the outlier is to not. And I, you know, I, I, I do think it's also important to respect the parents. I think the last, I think Donna reported at the last meeting, I think that it was 75% uh, of the parents in this town who participated in the survey want their kids to go back in some way. And I think we heard from Jeff, at least we heard from um, Jason Marin Gerides that it sounds like at least 80% of the kids are opting in for some sort of classroom experience. He's got about a classroom per grade that doesn't want to do that. So I think it's, I think it's important for people to have that choice and parents who don't want their kids to, to go in can, can have them not go in. But there are a lot of kids, we know that through the surveys we've done that the parents want their kids to go in. So I think we should respect that too. And I think the hybrid model um, does a good job at trying to be as safe as possible, but still providing some education. So that's where I am right now. Um, but I do want to hear what the other board members have to say. I will say that at this time of the uh, night, um, I cannot say it as eloquently as Phil, but I completely agree, agree with what uh, Phil said. And uh, Phil, you laid it out in a really clear and compelling way, especially listening to uh, the parents and what they want. And we do have options for virtual learning for those parents and students that don't feel comfortable coming in. And I can't even imagine all the time that was spent in planning, um, Donna and the rest of the administration. So thank you for that. And so I support this hybrid model. Other board members, Kimberly. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you all for your thoughts and um, and 
thank you to to the community members for their um, their input and their thoughts and their patience with us as we work through um, all the different options and scenarios and thank you so much to all the staff who and administrators and um, everyone who's given so much of their of their time and um, and heart and soul uh, into this process and I think you know we've all identified there is no no perfect answer um, I um, you know I, I have five kids and um and watch five very different experiences um with remote learning um in the spring and it for sure is not a model that works for everyone um as i sit here in the um town library parking lot <laughs> i recognize um connectivity issues alone um are a you know barrier for for people um i i hear um hope talking about not wanting to rush in and i and i see that i you know things change so quickly with that i i see that but i at the same time i feel like um our best window to get students into the building is now um you know i think i think the delayed uh delaying start a little bit and the rollout that um has been proposed gives people a little more time to feel comfortable with the building and feel more confident um that things can be done safely if people are compliant um i think there's a tremendous benefit for students to be able to see their teachers in person and um and develop connections with them at the beginning of the year with the knowledge that likely at some point we will not be able to continue to go into the buildings um and so having some kind of a relationship established i think will benefit people tremendously in their learning going forward um i think i would advocate um if we did move forward with a hybrid plan um that we assess and evaluate with regularity how we're doing on a safety level how people are feeling how things are going um and you know adapt and change as as we go along um likewise with with remote learning um i think um you know i think if if we can check in with people in the remote learning front a little more regularly um than we did in the spring and get feedback and uh and make changes we'll be in in a better place um but it's it's a tough decision and i i um yeah i i i struggle with it i don't i don't think there's a correct correct answer in this but i do believe that um education even if it's only two days a week for our students being in person um will be valuable Thank you, Kimberly. Other board members, Nasser or Elizabeth? Would you like to speak? I will speak. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, everyone has beautifully said we're in a tough situation. And even to this day, uh, I'm not for one or the other. Um, because the argument could be the same way, uh, meaning that the coronavirus uh, is holding us back quite a bit. But yet, um, I'll use me as an example. I was reluctant to go back to work, but to the city hall. And when I did go a few months ago, uh, based on the space and protocols and 
cleaning and everyone throwing their own garbage as opposed to the, the person coming to grabbing your trash, following some procedures, wearing the mask, making sure there was a um, certain number of people per square foot. And our, in, in, uh, in, um, our dining area has changed and uh, there were two different microwaves, different places. Those accommodations were applied and those accommodations are what we're trying to do at the school. And uh, it has worked for us. In the beginning, people were taking temperature for us. And then everyone was taking their own temperature. And eventually, as Perry said, people have to, or the, or the, one of the notes said, people have to be just honest and have to do their at home. So we cannot stay at home because we do not know how long this um, pandemic is going to last. It could be four months, it could be six months, it could be a year, even if the vaccine is available. So we we have to adjust to it. Um, and we have to adjust to it just so we can grab the life that we had. But more importantly, um, for certain kids who need that, uh, that physical space from a teacher or physical ground, uh, and for the health reason, for the academic reasons, so it's, it's, it's great. But at the same time, we are offering for people to opt out and study 100% from home. Uh, if that option was not there, then I could say, okay, uh, the hybrid is not going to work. So the fact that we are providing options, and I think uh, Donna is open to, and certain Jason said that, and other have said that, keep the questions coming, keep the concerns coming, and we are learning this together, and uh, we are going to move forward uh, with our option. Uh, my question from last time, and this time I'm going to ask, is probably from the nurse, and, and we probably do not know. I think Elizabeth asked the same question too last time. What would it take? That's the unfortunate part. Is it going to be two students? Is it going to be five students who are may be positive? Are we going to suddenly to stop? Are we going to do a transition? Are we going to slowly move out? Uh, that's one of the questions. And also, I would really like to see the funds, if possible, to be utilized for technology uh, uh, to do more online learning. In the ideal world, uh, teachers are gonna hate me for this. In the ideal world, I would love to see whiteboards, smart boards in each classroom, and the teachers will only attend their rooms and their classes, and they, uh, they sit there and they do online, online classes for everybody. Um, and if certain students are struggling, uh, they can go there, uh, uh, on, a, on a request basis or struggle basis and sit in that class too. But we are more or less doing that anyways. Uh, so the fact that we are open to questions and concerns and, uh, and willing to accommodate even the hybrid option even further, the fact, even for the fact that we can stop it at a certain point if necessary. So I would have to say the fact that we are offering multiple options or two options or we have done more or less uh, uh, satisfying everyone that was uh, submitted their response to their surveys. So that's my two cents. And for now, and it's, as Lori said, it's late. And uh, she does not sleep beyond nine, nine o'clock. So. So I'm going to speak up because I spent this time really listening to my fellow board members because there have been days where I felt like I knew what I wanted to vote for and then days when I changed my mind and then I really um, made an effort to come into this board meet meeting completely open-minded to be willing to be persuaded to feel that you know whatever we chose to do the risk was not greater than the reward and so I appreciate my board, my fellow board members. Um, I think that we are kind of ignoring the fact that we don't have great ventila ventilation issues. We are not going to be going into this in a good situation. No one has been able to convince me that we should ignore that. Um, I don't undervalue the, val the importance of 
face-to-face -face contact. But I think what everybody needs to remember is number one, we surveyed parents over a month ago. And many, many, many parents have come up to me and said, oh my gosh, if I could just change my answer, that was crazy. Because I, when I thought about it, I asked my child, do you wanna go back to school? And do I want them to go back to school? It was back to school the way school used to be. And that's not on the menu. School is not gonna be a social, emotional, positive experience. They are not gonna be congregating at their lockers. They're not gonna be chatting at lunch. They're going, it's going to look very different. It is not going to be a positive social experience. So it, I found that interesting and I don't believe that we should let any survey, especially a month old survey, drive us. Um, but every, you know, the emails that poured in over the last 10 days were compelling. And um, honestly, most of them were not in favor of getting back into the buildings. They were data driven, like this one that, that talks about the August 10th, 2020 current risk probabilities for events in schools operating in Maine. This is not data taken from anywhere else. So in Cumberland County, the risk event for an event size of 100, which is smaller than what we're talking about, is 28%, which means at least one person attending an event is likely to have COVID-19 or will have COVID-19. The next risk event size for Cumberland County was 81%. We would be looking at closer to 225 students, but then you add staff on. And it's, it's, it's not what makes me change my mind or push me in, but it's, it's data that really shouldn't be ignored. Um, so I, I put that out there. Um, I don't know. I think we, I think that our administrators have done an exceptionally outstanding job at developing these plans and they're incredibly thoughtful, but does the reward of two days in the building greatly outweigh the risk of two days in the building and does it meet the criteria of being the safest option while also being delivering high quality education and i guess i'm pretty dismayed to hear that we're not going to be able to offer really truly high quality education no matter what this year and i am really disappointed about that i'm concerned about our students going off to college in a couple years having had half their curriculum and, and wondering if we had gone to 100% remote that they really could meet on a much more frequent basis and do that. And maybe we call it remote plus where students with disabilities do come into the campus. Students with other issues do come into campus. I think several staff members mentioned this at our last meeting, which is we can call it what we want, but it's a different option that does offer services and options and even possibilities for, you know, bringing students for that social emotional. However people vote tonight, I think the parents need to really understand that they need to plan their social emotional um, experiences for their children outside of school because school is not what it used to be and that shouldn't be relied upon for those experiences. So I don't know how I would like to vote. What I wish I could vote on isn't on the table, which is sort of a remote plus, which would involve, you know, maybe students coming in to visit in small groups once in a while, prioritizing actual emotional relationships. And um, this, especially special ed kids who need those in-person services, which I 100% agree. There are many students that need those services in person and perhaps young children who aren't really able to access their education through the remote model. So thoughts, those are just my thoughts. Hope. Um, I would just, reiterate what Elizabeth said what what Raise I your hand again hope can you hear me mm -hmm. can you hear me yes okay um, I, I ideally I think um, Elizabeth's point what what I want isn't on the table and it's it, it would be a safer option for everyone who is in schools which is a lower population 
And I think the survey is probably wildly inaccurate because I know at least four families who answer differently on the survey for what from what they're actually doing or choosing to do now. Um, so we don't really know what those numbers are. And maybe if we knew we have 20% of the population going in and 80% do, choosing remote, that totally changes what it looks like. And, and we just don't have that data right now. Um, but I, I to, to go back to my original point, I, I don't want to derail planning and I don't, I don't not disparaging the planning process and I don't devalue in-person education. I do just feel simply that the two days in, I don't know that that's enough of a benefit to outweigh the risk that I see. Um, and maybe, and maybe it's just, it's, it's not, it's not as much of a risk as we think it is, but we won't know until schools start to go back. And I think that's where, um, you know, again, the, the, the possibility of not being the first school that goes back in Maine would be ideal. And I know obviously it's not on the table, so. But it is on the table. No, I said that's not on the table. Oh, I, I don't know. I mean, we, ha we don't have we, any. We have a vote. It's we on the table. I think anything's on the table. Well. <laughs> My greatest okay. concern, I'm sorry, I'm, well, I'm still here, is the, we don't know that we have the equipment we need and we know the facilities are, are not to, to standards that are needed for appropriate ventilation. So I feel like the facility, we, we could get the equipment, but the facility is still gonna be what they are. So we're kind of, again, it, waving our hands and ignoring that part. My internet connection is not going through. Heather, I just have a brief comment if you don't mind. It's not working. I don't think we're. After all this, I'm frozen. We can hear your voice if that helps. Phil, this is Kimberly. I think if you have a, a comment, I'm, I'm not sure if Heather's um, having Wi-Fi issues, but I think go ahead and, and make it. Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to respond since I was the one who brought up the survey. It's come up twice. I, I, and that's a very valid point. It's a little stale. But what I, the second part of what I was referring to is at least Pond Cove parents were, were asked to make a choice by Sunday, and then it was extended to Monday. So we have a little bit more data on that in terms of which parents um you know with the numbers at least at pond cove school i'm not quite sure about the other schools and so i don't know the exact answer but i was just basing it off of what jason's presentation was which said he sounded like he had about a classroom per grade that we're choosing the full remote based on um uh, the information that that pond cove parents were supposed to do so i was extrapolating that that meant around 80 percent were coming in and i i guess i should ask for clarification on that if jason knows that um uh, that information, but that would be a little bit more up-to-date information than the survey from a month ago. Would you like me to answer that, Heather? Yes, please, if you can answer it efficiently and quickly. Yes, yeah, so, so um, we have around 100 people that haven't answered yet, but we have 78 so far that have chosen full remote out of around 520. Okay. So just based on that questionnaire and that the parents know that that's not their final decision though. I, I told them that, you know, a district level 
um, registration form would be the final commitment. Thank you. So I would like to. Oh, is Heather there. back? <laughs> Go ahead, Elizabeth. Go ahead. I want to wait for you, but I would say that if it wasn't so late, I would really prefer to offer an amendment to the motion. But I mean, I feel like you know people are getting tired. I don't know if we're even doing our best work right now. What I would love to do is you know offer an amendment where we vote to go into a hybrid scenario and then make a planned move to remote learning around when they're, you know, the flu season and colds and whatnot are gonna coincide with us probably being pushed into remote learning anyway, instead of just being at the whim, like a boat out in the ocean without a rudder. I think that, you know, we've got this rolling start. So we have this, you know, smaller group of people coming in. We hopefully have more outdoor learning time in the warm weather. And then we make a choice to say, you know, November 1st through February vacation, we're remote and it's planned and we do a good job with it and we know what we're doing and it's not like last spring and that sort of thing. So I'm gonna kind of leave that in your hands, Heather, because I know it's late and I would prefer to offer an amendment, but I won't if that's just not gonna happen at 10.55 p.m. Yeah. Um, Donna, is it possible, I mean, that is food for thought for sure. Is it possible if we were to vote for remote learning to revisit this possibility in a month of um, turning completely to remote learning before the flu season at a specific date? Is that something that we can revisit at another time? Absolutely. In fact, we were looking at um, October 31st as kind of a revisit. Um, date anyway so so that we could be proactive and make the choice before uh, there were an active COVID case within our district sure. if we decide to close beforehand sure yeah I'm in a hundred percent agreement in that I think that that's a good approach thanks for the suggestion Elizabeth mm -hmm. um, Kimberly I um this isn't in regards to the um, a planned closing, but just um, cycling back to um, Hope had referenced, you know, some of the challenges maybe with um, athletics, and I um, I totally recognize how important the athletics are for a lot of kids. Um, for me, it just creates another just you know sort of conundrum of you have kids probably on, you know, travel teams who also play on the high school team who may be in a, you know, in a different cohort with their sports team than they are with their school team. It seems like, um, you know, on the one hand, we're making a tremendous amount of effort to have a cautious, um, you know, controlled plan um, and then, uh, and then just sort of setting it all out to the wind later on. <laughs> um, so I don't, you know, I, I know it's still a work in progress. I don't, I don't have a solution. Um, I, I, I guess for me that seems um, like a, a big question mark. Um, how we can do that um, and maintain the the safety that we're we're working really hard to create in the schools. Okay. I would second that as well, to really um, make a plea to families to think through the balance of um, athletics along with all the work that uh, administrators and nurses have done to try to create the safest possible re-entry to school. Um, it's late. A lot of people have said a lot of what I've said, what I was thinking. I don't want to um, speak too much, but I do have, is Perry still here? Yes, I see you, Perry. Um, I just have one question for you that's incredibly concerning to me. Um, having been on the building committee, knowing the state of our buildings, knowing how hard um, and challenging it is to clean them, and then tonight hearing about the ventilation. 
Um, I recognize fully that there is no guarantee of safety, um, that nobody can say we can take all the precautions necessary in coming to the schools and um, be 100% safe. But I have to say that was incredibly alarming to me. And um, I guess I'm asking for your opinion, having all these high school students walking around in hallways that have no ventilation, having nurses that are um, in rooms that have no ventilation, and then perhaps changing ventilation from central offices to share that with nurses. It, it, it just seems like where I land and my concern is neighboring districts may be able to open in a hybrid situation because of their buildings. Donna had spoken earlier that, you know, the factors are going to be, um, I think the two factors you stated were nurses and, and I think we're missing a little elephant in the room here about our buildings. Um, are they conducive to being able to bring us in safely? And I get that there's no guarantee, um, but you're the professional here. You're, you're, um, you're the one I'm looking to for guidance. I mean, is it, I, 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 I guess I, I need your opinion. Um, are you comfortable with us sending students and teachers into these buildings based on that information you just gave us. And I'm not saying that I need buildings that are shiny and perfect and beautiful. And I think that we can make do with rooms. But if we are consciously sending students and parents into buildings that are unsafe, um, I, I, that's like the, the stop for me. Um, because I was pretty on board with hybrid and I was I was pretty on board with some of the conversations with, that were happening and that is just a huge cause for alarm for me so do you mind speaking to that Perry yeah I, I mean I'm a, I'm a little on the spot as far as I know I'm sorry you know it's it's because because all I have to go by is guidelines and and it's really difficult to say uh, because nobody really nobody gives you a a point you need to hit. Um, all I know is that our air quality, and, and this is nationwide, this, this just isn't Cape Elizabeth. There are many schools that are of similar age and are struggling with the same thing. Um, that, that's a simple Google, and you will see that across the country. Um, our, our equipment is like the building 50 years old and you know Jeff Shedd and I had got into some conversations when we were trying to process um, better filtration and things like that um, where, where we've seen where uh, they're recommending like an uh, a MERV rating of 13 which is a, a more dense filter for for filtering out, out uh, just just everything dust pollens germs uh, they're making that recommendation. Our equipment cannot exceed a MERV 8 because it just doesn't have the velocity. If you were to put a thicker filter on, it would ultimately cut down how much air comes out the other side through the vents. So we, we are dealing with an age system. Um, I'll say I'm concerned and, that, and that's why I brought it up. I, I felt that if I don't bring it up, I wouldn't be doing my job. Um, That's all. I, that's all I gotta say right now. Um, we we don't meet standards set by um, the the. I'm, I'm drawing a blank right now. It's getting late. But the okay. the people that regulate air quality in the space, Ashier, I think it is. Uh, we don't meet all their qualifications. So it, unless the CDC or WHO gave me some type of point we needed to hit, um, then I could answer it better whether I thought it was dangerous or not. Um, all I can do is give my recommendation that, yes, there, there's, there's areas where we're not hitting those and not even coming close. And so to me, that sounds like we're putting students that are at the age closest, the most vulnerable students, the age closest to the adult age, which is the most susceptible at the highest risk. 
because you mentioned the high school being the school that had the worst ventilation. Right, um, and, and I, th I think Jill Young had put it best that we, don't, we, we may not have a single person in, in the district who, who, who was carrying COVID, um, but we have to treat it as if everybody does. Right. And, and you know, and I tell people when we're disinfecting the buildings, we can, we can disinfect the buildings, you know, that they're hospital grade in, in the morning, but as soon as people enter the building within the first hour, it, it's contaminated again, and, and we have to treat it that way. Thank you, Perry, for speaking up again. Um, I would like to say that I think that um, a lot of the emails that came were emails from teachers um, with concerns um, about returning to work and the ventilation and the contact that they would have with students. Um, I think um, the three principals have done, and they're the groups, the cohorts that have helped them have done it phenomenal job being creative and minimizing those risks. And so I really, really so very much want to commend you on that. Um, I hang my hat um, before I came to this meeting, as I said, I was a proponent of the hybrid and I'm hanging in my hat and I don't, I don't, I, I can't support that under this state of the buildings right now. Um, I know it comes at a risk of the students um, that are in most need. And I hope that um, we can work on that to make something shift in that. But um, I, in good conscience, I just feel like we're putting people in harm's way. So that's where I land. Are there any other comments? Kimberly. Uh, this is more just a question, but are there any options for like portable ventilation or any, um, you know, anything that, that might improve our ventilation, but not be a complete overhaul? We're, we're looking at some areas such as Karen's office to be able to try to correct that, but something like the hallway, um, not that we're seeing right now. Um, the, the hallways at the high schools do not have uh, windows that open. Um, they're, they're not designed to open. Um, we, we've discussed the possibility of opening, opening doors to the hallways, um, but then we have to weigh that against a security risk that the, the building is open to the public and, and, and not even as a, a danger to the student, but would other parents or, or, or other students not in the school that day, they would be able to gain access to the building when they're not supposed to be there. So um, yeah, as it stands right now, uh, we don't have one. And like I said, it kind of, it kind of goes back to that moving the air. Um, those, those type of units more than likely would blow air. Like you can get, you can get portable air conditioners and use something like that, but it blows the air and causes a direction, you know, where the ventilation that comes out of your ceiling usually travels about 10 feet across the ceiling before it starts to fall naturally by, by gravity. And that's so you're not creating that drafty feel when you're sitting in your office. Um, so there, you don't have that push of air blowing germs around like you would if you had a fan shooting down a hallway, um, moving the air quickly. Thank you, Perry. I have um, a follow-up, maybe more for the nurses. Um, would, if students and staff are wearing masks in the hallway, would that, um, you know, they're, they're presumably passing through that space into better ventilated spaces, would that, um, I don't know. Oh anticipate that might help a situation or we just don't know. I guess I can speak. Um, this is 
quite frightening, actually. Um, I was not aware of the nurse's office lack of ventilation. And it has me very unsettled. My stomach hurts. I feel sick. Like, <laughs> this is frightening. Um, okay, let me put that aside. <laughs> um, and the fact that we're considering using ventilation from the main office and doesn't sound like there's a great solution and our buildings don't sound safe. And my job is to ensure safety and well-being of our students, our staff, and our community. And I've known this going in and really struggled with this that I can't do that. But this, but you know, given the circumstances, I will do my very best um, in my role to do, you know, work at my best potential um, and give it my all. But this situation is something I can't control and even more so and it's frightening. Um, but the hallways, um, so we wear masks to protect others, not ourselves. Um, those cloth masks are not medical grade. They're protecting others. They're pro protecting them from the air we breathe out. Um, not as much as, you know, they're limiting that um, the travel of the droplets out and not as much in. And that's why the ventilation is so important. And the hallways um, would be the area of concern. And we've talked about that. There's a lot of passing, especially in the high school. And um, there's concern with that age range. There's concern with our staff. Our staff is, you know, not young and they're in those hallways too. Um, we have a senior staff and we're thankful to have that. Um, but there's just a lot of concerns with the ventilation and the safety of our building and bringing students back into the building that's not safe is frightening. Bill, would you like to speak? Yeah, I, I have a, uh, just a follow up for Perry. Just to clarify, because um, I wanna make sure I'm not misunderstanding, you're talking about the high school when you were talking about the hallways in the nurse's office? The, the hallways in the high school are the worst because yeah. they, they have never had a ventilation system installed from when it was built in 1969. The elementary school and the middle school does have ventilation, but I believe it may only be like one or two vents per hallway. Mm -hmm. That's it. So it's, it's not desirable, but it does have it. It doesn't, it doesn't meet standards, is, is I guess is what the best way of putting it. And is that is that the case? I know you. It's hard for me to put you on the spot, but um, setting aside the high school, it sounds uh, troubling. Um, but the other buildings, is that is that a standard? I mean, we're talking about all the other districts, you know, with the same, some of the same schools. Is that a standard thing, or are we are we just an outlier here? Is this a really bad situation? For our schools or is this would this be standard around the state for these kind of buildings it, it's standard for the schools that are equal to ours in age mm -hmm. uh, our immediate uh surrounding schools all have newer facilities so they have the upgraded ventilation systems and and rooms such as elizabeth said rooms that haven't been converted into two spaces and, and closets that are have become offices right. and things like that um but but anything in our in our range uh certainly northern maine i'm sure is just, uh dealing with the same issues uh but like i said it, it, yeah, if you simply google air quality in schools in america it, it's an issue it, it's really the, the newer it, the newer schools are the ones that are a little better off than the rest of us. Yeah, our, our, our preschool, I know, would put in ventilators um, uh, to the hallways and that seemed to work there. Uh, what, I, I just want to circle back because I alluded to this in my, when I, in my commentary at the beginning, but I said I didn't want to do it because it would complicate it, but I think I'm going to ask for the amendment. I, from the very beginning, I was, uh, you know, and we can look right across the river to Portland, right? So, so Portland is proposing a different model um, of having the schools at least 10 through 12 not go in and K through nine, in their case, go in. I, I would urge us to not think of a one size fits all. I think what we just heard about the high school is very troubling. So, um, and so at this point, unless we get in more information, I'm, I, I guess I'm sorry, you know, I, I would be more insistent on that model. I was just gonna suggest it before, but now I'm more insistent on it. I do think 
we should treat the, the, the lower schools differently. I, I would hate to have us uh, vote because of what we just heard about the high school and say that means, you know, the kindergartners can't go in either if, if we have a different set of facts. So that's where I am. I don't know how that, what that would look, but it, you know, to the extent there would be an amendment, I, I, would, I would offer that. Um, I, I know that in this town, we like to have equity and we wanna make sure that everyone has the opportunity to go in if we're gonna go in or not go in if we don't. But I, I think it's we should think creatively about that. And if and if uh, you know older kids have higher rates of transmission and the buildings are less safe, then maybe we treat the the high school differently, um, and not just make a decision for all grades because of that one piece of information we just got. So I just offer that. I'm sorry. I just want to say one other thing because it's incredibly frustrating. I have to say it as a member of the building committee, and I know all our members here were members of the building committee, our buildings need work. We had a lot of time. It's not the time now. We've got to work on reopening. But I, but I hope we get back to that really soon because what we're here, our building, if, if, we're, if we're having to make a decision because our, on our kids' education, because of something that should have been taken care of years ago, and now we're hearing about it because of this problem, that's incredibly upsetting. And, and we need to work on our buildings sooner rather than later. I think this is obviously giving us um, um, a supercharged reason to do it. And I and we had to shut down those meetings for a reason, but this is just all the reason why once we get through the reopening that we need to go right back to those meetings and, and present something to the community because the last thing we want is to have to shut down a building at a time when there's not a pandemic because of the air quality. Um, and so anyway, I just feel like I had to get that off my chest because it's been, it, it's something we need to worry. We've been having to work on and we set shut that down for a reason, but we need to really get back to that once we get past the reopening. Nasser. Yeah, um, maybe Perry will give us a one on one lesson on ventilation. Um, is the air being circulated? And you also refer to the article or to your research too, that uh, people did, do catch viruses in hospitals through the ventilation system as well. So is the air circulating or does it actually bring uh, a fresh air from outside and sucks the air that's in the room? Can you describe how it's supposed to work and how does our work? And especially when you mentioned that you're gonna take something from the main office and share with the uh, nursing uh, office. Uh, how does that work? Are we just taking uh, air from one room to another room or can you describe that? And also on your research part, uh, what is the research that what is, you discovered or you, because I heard that also that people do get catch this disease through the ventilation as well. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> Like I said, I just learned about, or just before we went into the meeting, I, I had read an article um, that I think we'll hear more about later as far as them coming to the conclusion that this could be an, uh, contagious by aerosol, which is just breathing in and out. It's, it goes past a, a cough and a sneeze. Um, but I, I think we're still early in the game for that. Like that, that just hit the news right before the meeting. Um, that would definitely be a game changer because now you're talking about something that is floating in the air for, you know, could be hours. Um, anyway, back to the back to the ventilation. The in the normal operating time, we mixed indoor air with outdoor air. So, and and that's especially in in the winter time. So you're not drawing in 100% outside air and trying to heat it to 80 degrees to allow it to, to heat the space. Um, we would mix it with 70 degree air that could be in the classroom. And, the, and so you're mixing fresh air and uh, existing room air together, which blows back into the room. What we're going to, what we would be doing to our ventilation system is opening those air dampers wide open for fresh air. And those will bring in 100% fresh air and exhaust the existing air uh, through, back out through the building. Um, the nurse's office, 
the nurse's office, I, I'm a little baffled as to why it doesn't have ventilation because all the rooms around it do have ventilation. <laughs> it's, a, it's a really strange setup. Um, the, the high school has two uh, conference rooms, a large conference room and a small conference room. Both those spaces have an excess of air in them meaning that you can actually hear the air blow out of the ventilation and it's, it's actually too too strong for the the space so what i what we're looking at, at what we can do there is actually take some of that air away from those conference rooms and blow it into the nurse's office and and same with removing the air as well um, it, it's not uncommon uh, last year, I went into those conference rooms and actually throttled the vents down because they were blowing too strong and being disruptive for meetings. So I know it, it has the capability of supplying the air. It's just a matter of rerouting duct work and getting it into the nurse's office. Um, my, my larger concern is obviously the hallways and, and the transitioning of classes and things like that. Did I get all of them? Yeah, I, I think you did. So the answer is no to the question that the air is actually grabbed from one room to another room. Is that is that a yes it, or no question? In in some spaces, it varies. Um, in the middle school and elementary school and parts of the high school, we have a rooftop unit which comes down, the air comes down into the building and goes to multiple areas from that one unit. 90% of the high school classrooms have what's called a unit ventilator, which is a through the wall, similar to what you would have in a hotel room. And that, that unit is designed just for that space. So it, it's a combination of the two style of units. Okay. So just last common question. Uh, so if the article from the New York Times to be true, and then in, in a week or so we find out that it is airborne, the ventilation is not gonna help us, do we make a decision of not having a, a hybrid option? So that's those are, as you said earlier beautifully, uh, you have sank my battleship. So it's, it's a constant we're chasing our tail basically. Yeah, I, I think we'll learn, we'll learn more if anything becomes of this, um, uh, this aerosol that they discovered, that they're actually, it is actually uh, airborne. Um, I, I, I think that they've proven it. Now I guess what they have to do is prove, is that airborne particle enough to cause you to be sick? So... <laughs> We're all learning as we go right up to the top, so. <laughs> Elizabeth, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. So number one, um, the New York Times is sort of like the last place that this information lands. It is in the air. The science supports that it's aerosolized and it is circulating. Um, all medical experts agree. So it's sort of a moot point. It's what Perry said. Is, is it enough to make people sick? So there we go. Um, I appreciate Nasser asking specifics about our ventilation system, but I'm not a ventilation expert and Nasser is not. And the American Society, and I don't remember, I was on the board at the time, I'm trying to look it up. We don't meet standards in any of our schools. It's just worst at the high school, but we don't meet standards in any of our schools. And I will do my best. I'm looking now. It is, oh God. Oh whatever, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers, something like that. I, Perry, I mean, he'll, we don't. And to echo Phil, I hope every member of the community watches this, that our schools may not open because our buildings are so bad. And it is time and we need to invest the money into these buildings. Anyway, the, the ventilation is not appropriate. It's distressing. Um, and the last point I need to make is that I believe 
still made an amendment and I hope it was an official amendment because the board needs to either accept or reject the amendment. Um, we can, if it's a friendly amendment, meaning that the board is fine, then we accept the amendment. Otherwise we have to vote on discussion of Phil's amendment, but I, this board member accepts the amendment. Just so you know, Elizabeth, I hadn't forgotten that I was going to come back to it, but thank you for bringing that up again. Hope. Uh, so Phil's amendment was Pond Cove open, the other two no, or I, I'm not sure. I just, I'd, we need to clarify on that, but my, I was going to comment on that, that I think the middle school also has a the middle schools are, was built in 1930s, I believe. I, I think we can only, you don't need, you know, scientific or a HVAC um, certificate to understand what the ventilation looks like in there. Um, and I just wanted to sort of try to say, you know, we, we can't, um, we each may have, I have ideas for an amendment too. Um, you know, I'd say put us, um, you know, start in red and if I'm wrong, we'll know and then we go yellow and we're all more comfortable with it that's you know that's my amendment um I, I don't know that that's how this you know what's the most efficient way to do this i don't know i know we need to just give parents a decision and it'd be nice to give them the, the plan tonight to know this is what it's going to look like so uh laura um, I, I think it's good this discuss and even though I'm nowhere near an HVAC specialist or ventilation specialist, it is good to hear though, and um, although it's distressing to hear the state of our buildings. And I, I like Phil's amendment, but then I also heard from Perry that, okay, the elementary school does not meet standards, and not, none of our schools meet standards. So then if that's the case, um, although I was a strong proponent of the high, hybrid model um, to start, um, this really does change my opinion. But then like Hope said, if we start off red and then okay, then we, we decide after a little while to go to yellow. I don't think we can decide to go to yellow until we fix the ventilation in our, in our building. So then that would be quite a, a long time, I would think. Elizabeth, Hope, and Laura still have hands up. I don't know if they're forgot. Oh, I can put it down. Okay, Hope. Uh, so my point, if we start in red, we will know soon, we will have data from Maine within a month of what, happen, what happens elsewhere. So if, if everybody, if it goes well and nothing, there's no outbreaks and schools are going fine, then we, we could all feel more comfortable with actual data based on our state. To, to the yellow and I think then we could we could maybe set aside the ventilation issue but I so that's that was my point that if if we discover that other schools can do it and it's not the numbers don't go up then we okay. have a little bit more comfort that was my point yeah I'm really struggling with this because for me it's not about to me it's about the ventilation only so like obviously I had already said I'm mm -hmm. comfortable with a hybrid model um, in fact, I think it's the best model for the kids. Um, and given the data, I mean, we're not experts, you said, I'm not experts in ventilation, but I'm also an ex not expert in health. Um, and so I'm going on what the CDC is saying and, our, and the governor is saying on the reopening and our, you know, and our plan. I mean, that's what I'm basing it on. I'm not setting, I'm not putting myself in, that, in those shoes. But I have concerns about the ventilation. I mean, to me, it's about that. So if we're gonna go red, we're not gonna go back, in my view, if it's about ventilation, because that's the only part that I'm thinking about at this point. It's not about, it's not the other side of it. Um, you know, I, I, look, I was, I, I hate to say this because I don't want to delay. I really don't. I think parents, teachers need to know, but parents really need to know. I mean, that's mm -hmm. what I heard the most when I run surveying people. Par uh, teachers clearly need to know. Parents keep on asking me, do I need to get a sitter? Do I need to get, you know, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. And honestly, people are being taken up already. Uh, you know, the help uh, uh, that people are going to ask for, you know, and so we need to make a decision. But this feels very last minute to me, I'll have to say. Um, and for us to make a sh shutdown decision for the school because of what, you know, 
at 1130 and we're hearing, you know, a little more detail on that where we haven't heard it tonight. I just, I feel very unsettled making that decision based on that reason. I, I, I want to know, is this something that, um, I think it is important to know, is this something that uh, the experts have looked at when they're talking about reopening schools? You know, is it something that we need to be concerned about? If something we need to be concerned about, then we should be concerned about it. Um, and again, I'm talking about the other two schools. I mean, I'm concerned about the high school and I would still offer my amendment, whether it's tonight or next week, to um, have full remote at the high school. Um, but I, I feel like I need to know a little bit more about the ventilation issue. I just feel very unsettled saying I, we're closing down because uh, we've got 60, our built buildings were built in the 1960s. That, you know, that just doesn't feel, it's not based on science to me at this point. I want, I'd like to know what that means, you know, what, what the experts are saying about that um, in this state and around the country about our schools um, before I can just make that decision, which I will affect. Remember, I, I mean, I know you guys know this, but I'm thinking about it's going to affect obviously everyone in this town and their, and their kids mm -hmm. and their ability to have, uh, to have kids home. So I don't know if we can get information in a week, but at, at 1130, I'm, I'm thinking like, you know, this is like, feels very last minute to me. Uh, on the ventilation issue. Um, so I see Laura and Nasser for a second. I am feeling the same way. I, it's, um, it's hard to think. It's a five hour meeting. I know that there's a need to have a decision. Um, Donna, what are our options um, as far as tomorrow night, the next night, the next week, if we, um, if we don't come up with a decision tonight? which I know is the best case scenario and I know everybody wants it, but this is a really big decision on our part, the seven of us. And um, this well, is like a game changer. We have been working on, you know, the hot plans for the hybrid model. We've been working all along on uh, plans for uh, hundred percent remote. Um, so we, it would mean that we would just continue working on both sets of plans. Um, and we have a meeting uh, tomorrow's my, uh, Thursday night. I mean, we have administrators here. Can uh, I don't think we could get answers by Thursday night. Um, mm. I'm, I'm not even sure what the questions are at this point. So, I think um, I think part of it is for us seven to like pause and think and, I, and make I would, it maybe on 11:30 at night next Tuesday night, probably. Okay. Um. I'm gonna, I would like to, to go in that direction and ask board members one at a time if they're okay with that. Um, I do see Laura and Nasser with their hands raised. Um, oh, this is just an old hand raised for me. I just can't get it down at this point. Okay. Please disregard. Um, Nasser, is this something that you want to say right now before I go and ask individual board members the question? Uh, I think you can ask the question, yeah, because I am, um, leaning towards that and I'm having second thoughts based on what I'm hearing because as much as the teachers and we the administration can control with mask and sanitization and all that and if the building is a trap why do all that why I'll do that so we want to know if the ventilation if the building is a trap for this or not so I am uh, ready to extend this till next week if okay. necessary. Uh I'm just going to go through. Kimberly, are you willing to press pause right now? Yes, I am. Okay. Uh, Phil? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, Nasser just said he was hope. Yes. I feel like we're putting Perry in a really bad spot and he's going to come back and say the ventilation is bad and schools close. I think we already know the answers. I you know, I, so I, I feel like pa this pause is another, <laughs> I, I don't think we should, I, I, I'd love to make a decision tonight. That's my feeling is I feel like the waiting is just killing everyone. Um, I don't, you know, so I, 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 I'd, I'd, I'd move forward tonight or wait, but I, I mean, I think we really should give people an answer. I do too. And I think if it were 8.30 at night um, and some of this 
I mean, it's hard to think after five hours and it's hard to weigh the options. And I think um, I, I'm still a proponent for waiting. I hear very clearly what you're saying, Hope, um, but I, I definitely am gonna push for a pause. Uh, um, Elizabeth. So I agree with Hope, there's no new information to be had. We know the ventilation is bad. We know it doesn't meet standards. Um, there's nothing more. We've, we've got the, the report from Colby Company and Engineers that told us all this. I mean, we got some more alarming specifics tonight, but honestly, I, there's no shock in my face. This, this was expected. Um, if people feel like we need to pause because of exhaustion, that's a different thing. Um, as far as putting Perry on the spot to get more information, we're not getting anything new. The ventilation is terrible. It's horrible at the high school, maybe not quite as bad at the elementary school, and I don't even know what to say about the middle school. So I'll, I'll go with the will of the board. I, I, um, I agree. I'm not, I'm, I'm not asking for a pause. Um, to put Perry on the spot, Perry. I want you to hear that loud and clear. I, 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 I agree, I don't know what more information he can get. Um, I knew the buildings were in tough shape. I did not know the ventilation piece of it, which is a huge component to um, contracting the illness. Um, and I honestly am not, I, I can't think right now. And I, and I, I, I am personally feeling tremendous pressure at this point, making a decision um, at this hour. So it, it's more, um, not for more information, but for time to pause and think and digest this and say, is this enough to, to close the buildings? I think it is, but it is such a huge decision that it, it's, not, it, it, it's not in my comfort level to make it at 1130 at night. That's where I'm coming from. Heather, if we table this discussion, can we at least move on to the calendar, which seemed like a pretty straightforward vote? Um, I, well, before, before you table this, what about the, can you, can, Heather, can you, I know you're, you're probably brain dead by now. Uh, can you at least follow what Hope said, that we accept, amend it and follow that we, we, we open schools in red and then make a decision further? Or is that still not an option? I, I, I think that if we're voting red, we're voting red for a couple of months. I, I don't think we're saying we're voting yeah. red until next Tuesday when we meet again, because I don't think that helps the administrators at all. Um, we, we don't want to give them false hope that, or false idea that if we're just going to come revisit it in a week, I think if we're coming to revisit it in a week, we're coming to revisit it in a week and not to, to lead them down a certain path to then disre potentially disregard it um, and, and head into. Um, okay, I understand. Yeah, red is basically buying time. We don't want to necessarily buy time. Okay. We can buy time if we want to buy it for two months. Yeah. I, I don't think it buys us time for a week. Donna, you were going to speak? No, no. About the calendar when um, Elizabeth spoke up or no? Yeah, no, no. Okay. Um, sorry, as a member of the community, um, perhaps I'm not supposed to be speaking at this point, but yeah. there are... There gonna, are I, I have to interrupt because, I, because I've made it clear to everybody. I'm so sorry. But this is discussion for board members only at this point. Um, I know the community input is very important. Um, I just see your name is Nelson's. Um, I don't know your first name. My apologies for speaking to you in this way, but um, just out of respect and equity. Um, nobody else has been able to speak up. And so I'm sorry to cut you off, um, but this is discussion for the board at this time. So again, my, my deepest apologies. Um, I'm just following policy right now. Um, I mean, I suppose we could go ahead, Phil. I just wanted to just respond to um, a comment Elizabeth made, which I appreciated, but I just want to make it clear. It's not that um, it's not based on being tired. It's really based on understanding what the HVAC system is, 
um, that's a really big reason to close the schools for uh, these reasons. And if it wasn't safe before, it wasn't safe uh, now, right? It's, 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 is this a safe building? We have the cool report. You know, I, I know some people who work at places where before they went back, they had a, you know, I just got a, a, an email from someone right now saying they had an epidemiologist and an HVAC expert walk through, get a report, and then they went back. That's the kind of, and if, and if we had something like that, and I, you know, it said that it was not um, safe, then I would say that's, that's something that I'd like to know. And that we both, it's that if, if it comes back and we said, no, that actually has makes no difference or whatever, I, I would just like to base it on actual facts. Um, and not the report which we've had sitting around, you know, it, it's a report we need to act on. We need new buildings, as Elizabeth said. We need to work on that very soon. But to then use that at 1130 at night for the reason to close um, and not for other reasons, you know, that we've been talking about. That's just where my concern comes from. I just want to understand the issue better. Um, and, and it just feels like a, at the last minute. Right, um, and I and I think I think the community will feel that too. Quite frankly, I think I'm speaking for a lot of members of the community when I say that. So if we come back in a week and we have better information and, and it looks like it's just too bad to open, then that's that, and that's it, and we won't open. Um, but it really is less about the lateness of the day. I because I just want to be clear. I think we should have voted tonight. I think we owed it to the administrators, the parents, and the teachers uh, to have an answer very soon. So that was my strong preference, and I. Uh, um, but. But I, I now think, um, given the situation and where I think this is going, I think I want to understand it better before I vote on it. And I'd say no more than a week, because I, people, people need to know. So that's, that's what I'd put a plug in for. No longer than next Tuesday, if possible. I'll stop talking. Now my hand raised is actually a real hand raised, oh. Heather. It's not the fake one. So I agree with what Phil said, that if we actually have someone come in and assess the buildings and assess the ventilation, because none of us are ventilation experts, and maybe it is like what Elizabeth said, like, listen, there's no surprises here. We don't have adequate ventilation. It doesn't meet standards in any of the buildings. And then our decision is really clear. And I think we can defend it really clearly to the community and also then bring it to everybody's awareness, the state of the buildings but I would like to see some type of concrete, this is it, the ventilation is not adequate, but I don't know, can we have that turned around by next Tuesday? I'm yeah. not sure um, if that's an option or do we really look into this and just not rush into it and delay the start of the school a month until we have a thorough investigation and then we can all present to the community with confidence in our decision. Um, and you know I'm tired because you know my bedtime's at nine, but I'm not saying this because I'm tired. I, I, I think the information needs to be there. And I would like to see the information before the meeting so that we can look over it, digest it, and then ask questions during the meeting. Um, but we have some time you know, to, to take a look at it. So that is what I'm proposing. Perry, not to put you on the spot. Um, if we were to vote tonight, hypothetical situation, and let's say we were to vote for remote learning for a month or six weeks or whatever the time frame was, do you think it's possible to bring in experts and find out more information about what Laura and Phil were saying and therefore we could revisit it um, with more information? I, I wanted to add that my specialty trade is heating, ventilation, and air conditioning. It's what my schooling's in and 15 years of doing service work in it before getting in the facilities. But having said that, I, I would not mind giving myself a second opinion. And uh, I, you know, as, I, as I'm listening to everybody speak, I could probably call um, Colby company and have them bring a couple of HVAC engineers out and uh, see what we can get from them. Uh, I, I don't think it within a week would be a problem. Right? You know, given, given I don't know their schedule right now, it would not be a problem for me to turn that around. Um, and, and 
you know, maybe I could have them do the presentation. My, my biggest question is I'm looking, I'm looking at Donna up here on the left side of my screen, and I'm just wondering how this decision affects the schedule and what, what parents need to know and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Nasser. Yes, uh, I know Elizabeth says I'm not an expert in HVAC, and I agree with her. However, uh, Perry, before you bring any engineers uh, for HVAC, they're going to be checking the physical aspect of it. They're not going to check spraying in one room a certain chemical, a certain smell that would end up in another room uh, as well. They have to inspect it based on today's pandemic uh, reasoning as well. So if you do invite anybody to make sure they take that, that part. Sorry, Elizabeth, but I had to put my <laughs> two cents about being an HVAC expert. Um, so that's it for that. Sorry. Yeah, and I, and I do encourage everybody to, I believe it's online. I, I have it here. I can't share my screen with you. But um, there, the report is online, I believe, on the school's website. You'd, you'd have to look at the 2019 one because there is an older 2012 there, but they didn't get into the depth that Colby Company did with uh, throughout the building. So um, when, when I started my touring through the schools and, and looking into things deeper, I, would, I went through the report first. Um, so that, that is out there that you can review on your own um, after the meeting. Not tonight. Not tonight. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so Heather, if I may. Oh, yes. Yeah. Sorry, Elizabeth. So I have reviewed the report. I have read it. And my question to Perry is, did Colby Company and engineers bring in HVAC specialists when they gave us these designations when they gave us this report? Or I mean, we're, did, have we already had the experts in and they've already told us and maybe we need an epidemiologist, which I would not be against, but we, I've read the report. Did, did like an architect do that or did HVAC specialists do that section? No, each individual section was done by an engineer that's in that field. So this was... Uh, surveyed throughout the schools as a, by a mechanical engineer to, to, to do the report plumbing plumbing uh, I'm, I'm sorry mechanical does the plumbing as well but electrical engineer did the electrical part and so on and structural did the structural part it, it was all individual engineers going through the buildings uh, separately thank you Laura, is your hand up again? Yeah, it's just up. I'm just saying that um, I'm going to wrap it up for the night because um, it's been a really long meeting and I have a, a very big day tomorrow. But if we can wrap up in the next few minutes here, I can stay on. If not, um, I will have to go. Okay. Um. I want to go revisit people's desire to vote one more time. I am ready to vote. Kimberly, do you want to vote or go to next week? Oh, um, I, I am come back to you. Yeah, no, I think I would like to vote next week. I'm with the community and the administrators. I'd like an answer, but I would like it to be an answer I feel good and confident about, and I just don't know that I, um, I need to process this right now. Uh, Phil, are you still wanting to wait till next week? Uh, yes, please. Um, Elizabeth, are you still for tonight? I'm for next week. 
Okay. Uh, Nasser. X two is fine. Next week. Hope. I'm I'm ready to vote now because my vote does not is not contingent on the the ventilation. Okay. Uh, and then Laura, while you're still on. Next week. Next week. Um, so it sounds like the majority, and I'm, I, this is new territory, so I'm asking for help. Is, is this what happens? There needs to be a motion to, I, I don't know what to do now. So anybody who. No, no somebody needs to them. make a motion. I'll, I'll make a motion to table um, the um, remainder of the agenda. Can I do that? Uh, a motion to table the remainder of the agenda until next Tuesday, August 18th. Do I have a second? Second. Um, okay. Um, I guess we'll vote. Uh, Heather is a yay. Kimberly Carr? Yay. Phil Saucier? Yay. Elizabeth Seifries? Yay. Nasser Shear? Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. Laura Danino. Yay. Um, and so we just need a final motion to close the evening, please. I move we adjourn. I have a second. Second. Uh, Heather Altenberg, yay. Kimberly Carr. Yay. Phil Saucier. Yay. Elizabeth Seifries. Yay. Nasser Shear. Thank you for everyone to be here for this long. Yay. Hope Straw. Yay. And Laura Danino. Yay. Thank you everyone for your time. Good night.